I'm just going to give you a little bit of background about the Digital Scholarship Network um, and also um, our sort of last symposium um, before I hand over to Eleonora, who will be chairing the sort of first session. Um, so the Digital Scholarship Network is a peer network of colleagues colleagues working right across the UK, looking at the challenges um, and how we develop, deliver um, digital scholarship services within research libraries. And um, looking back, I realized we were sort of, it kicked off in 2018. I remember when it was first announced and the first meeting um, took place in, in 2019. Um, and our first co-chairs um, were Beth Clark, um, and um, one of my former colleagues from Edinburgh. But since then, we've had a vast range of events. Um, so just looking back, um, there have been, we're now onto our, our second set of co-conveners, but we've had 18 network meetings. We've had a previous international symposium that I'll say a little bit about. We also put together one international funding bid. We've had a number of working groups also undertook two surveys and published a report, have set up the Transatlantic Skills Directory um, and have also got a kind of communal resource within our website as well. Um, and again, through the network, we've gradually grown and developed a kind of range of different activities, different workshops, also working in partnership very much with the US with CLEAR developing and setting up joint sessions that we've been running over the last couple of years. Um, that kind of kicked off um, in sort of 2020, where we started doing shared um, working sessions um, for our members, along with the ever popular speed dating, um, in order to meet new people and share experiences about how things were going, how we could help and support each other. And it has really grown into a fantastic network where colleagues can share experiences, learn from each other, discover who's doing what, and almost have a little bit of a, a bank of who's who of where people are working, if you need help and support, the network has provided that sort of introduction and the ability to be able to pick up and go back to people in order to follow up with projects they were running or get a bit of advice and guidance. So it's been really great. And we've also managed to do some really great pieces of work looking at digital infrastructure um, earlier this year and kind of coming out with recommendations and guidelines, also looking at copyright. So hopefully we've provided a range of really helpful resources um, over the period that people have found useful in their work and then helping them take forward digital scholarship. So I am really delighted and we've got a great mix of speakers here today for um, our second symposium. Um, and our first symposium was almost exactly three years ago. Um, and I was just thinking, gosh, the world three years ago was a very different place. And I'm really delighted that some of our speakers um, such as Killian um, and Rick as well are here today joining us again to help us reflect and think about where we are, what some of the challenges are and how we can take this work forward. Um, but that was a in-person symposium um, that took place at the British Library. Um, and again, I think world events have really changed. I kind of look back in 2019, seems a very long time ago, seems like no time at all. And I think we've all had that sort of time warp experience um, that the last couple of years have brought us. And again, I don't think any of us could have imagined um, that we would have to deal with world events as they turned out or the challenges within our work that we've all had to look at and overcome over the last couple of years. I think the last couple of years have been really interesting because digital has come to a forefront in a way that I don't think any of us would have imagined. And digital has really enabled many of us to continue working, but we've all developed new ways of working and we've all gained a vast range of digital skills um, that we, I don't think, anticipated we would have. That did make me think a little bit about is digital scholarship still something unique and specific um, and do we still need to put in the amount of effort that we do? But then in thinking about it, I also realised that while 
digital skills and techniques have moved on and data science and kind of thinking around about data and data analysis and algorithms and AI are things that are much more within our conversations and our kind of vocabulary these days, we're still not there yet as a sector and still have a lot of work to do. And we've got a lot more to do around about both the skills that we need within our universities um, also to enable our researchers to access our collections. And we've still got a lot of work to do around about our collections and making those collections computationally available in order to do this type of research. So I think there's a lot still to do and there's a lot of interesting challenges still to, to tackle. And I think I'm really looking forward to being able to spend the next sort of couple of hours hearing around about how different networks and organizations have dealt with and taken forward digital scholarship and kind of computational access to collections, um, but also thinking about how can we move things forward? How can we all help and support each other in order to move on to the next step? And what maybe have we got from the last couple of years that are something that are beneficial, that will help us take this forward, and what are some of the challenges that are perhaps still there. I think one of the other things that has really changed in the UK as well is the funding landscape. And um, we had a number of funders join us at the last symposium talking about the funding and the funding that was up and coming. And again, we'll hear Jane, um, Professor Jane Winters reflect around about um, the UK and Irish um, funding that's been made available, but also um, UKRI and AHRC have changed some of their funding models. And it's been really great to see funding calls come through that really support digital scholarships, digital scholarship within the arts and humanities, looking both at physical and digital infrastructure for that. And again, just thinking about the recent UK RI AHRC call, which was looking at embedding digital skills in the arts and humanities. So there's still a need. We still need to do more, but a lot has changed and a lot is helping us move things forward. Um, and as I say, it'll be great to hear what has happened and where we can continue to go. Just now um, looking at the first panel, um, and as Kirsty mentioned, um, in terms of um, um, reflecting on digital scholarship and what we've done so far, the first panel is actually looking at um, institutional perspective, thinking about um, how institutions have addressed any challenges and find any opportunities, um, and and also thinking about where we're going now uh, what is going to be the next step so i'm really really pleased to introduce um abby potter and megan um Fertel. they're both um working as a senior innovation specialist at the library of congress digital innovation lab and they are doing a um, double act and dual act um presenting their work uh, on the feasible adaptable and shared a call for community framework for implementing a um, machine learning artificial intelligence um so i will just um let you <laughs> take you from here. <laughs> Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm going to share my screen. So is that visible? Can you all see that? Yes, yes, okay, perfect. Great. Uh, well, Thank you so much, uh, Eleanor, for that introduction and uh, to the Research Libraries UK for having us here and uh, to Kirsty for inviting us here to share this proposal. Um, and it's about an aspect of digital scholarship, which is um, machine learning and AI. In, and it's both a technical tool that provides machine readable text and information. So um, OCR is, is a backbone technology for um, a lot of uh, that uh, for a lot of digital scholarships, it provides the machine readable information and text that um, people are analyzing. Um, but it's also AI and ML are also a set of technologies that are really poised to alter the capabilities of and relationships between users and stewards of library, archival, and museum collections. So, our proposal is that um, we develop ways of planning, implementing, assessing, and improving shared practices for AI and ML that align with our values and our strengths as um, LAM professionals. I'm using LAM in short of library archive museum professionals. Um, and that based on um, the foundational experiments and research that's been already been done, um, we can, and, and, and if we add additional use cases and perspectives, we can create a framework 
that will allow for the transparent, responsible, practical, and coherent ad adoption of these technologies in, in LAMS. So today we're going to um, share about how we've been approaching machine learning in, in the LC labs and reflect on um, other flourishing efforts that have been going on in parallel in our broader professional communities in LAMS and sort of adjacent communities, and then introduce some of the resources that we've been developing to contribute to community practice. So um, why did we sort of start on this, uh, this, this road and why should we sort of do this together? So we think we have a lot of, um, uh, well, AI and ML have a lot of potential to be really helpful tools. We've already seen this with OCR. It's, it's you know, sort of enabled digital scholarship. Um, uh, and uh, we have a lot of shared challenges that it could also be helpful with. Um, so some of these shared challenges include um, increasing user expectations. Uh, so um, what users are expecting from our services, from our tools. Um, and we'll dig into this a little bit more in, in the next slide. But also the the our, another shared challenge that we have is are the heterogeneous and historic realities of of our content, and um, that this content is is growing, um, especially born digital content uh, and digital publishing formats are changing and growing, while our budget our budgets remain limited. So we um, are in this. Uh, uh, um, place where we, we don't have um, a lot of funds or resources to sort of um, to, to understand these technologies or how to operationalize them. And another reason, another challenge is that there's a gap in expertise in using these technologies in, in, our, in our organization. So um, with these shared challenges, we think it's, it's really important to, to, uh, to ground ourselves in, in sort of what we do best. So that's sort of where this proposal is coming from. Um, the, uh, but we also want to acknowledge that um, AI and ML are not the only ways to, just only strategies to meet our challenges or the only tools to help us, but it feels inevitable that these technologies are, are going to shape the future of our services um, uh, they're already embedded in many of our uh, many of the larger vendor services and all of the cloud services. So we're going to have to sort of figure out <laughs> what we want to do with these as, as a community. So this is a call to not opt out of engaging with AI and ML, but to learn about the benefits and costumes so we can shape the adoption of these technologies in our spaces. Oops. Okay. So. Um, we really look at AI and ML as sort of the next wave that's coming towards our organization. So we have, um, our organizations have a long history of, of adopting to um, new technologies. We've, uh, including digitization, online access, digital preservation. And, um, and we see AI as that next sort of wave that's coming towards us. And um, uh, the, the promise and claims of AI systems to transform our organizations and solve our intractable, in, intractable challenges with sort of data-driven results and solutions are enticing. But, um, uh, but we have experienced and others have reported on that um, even though they're that sort of at first glance, the benefits seem enormous, there's also uh, um, sort of bumps in the road or sort of you know, um, the... Uh, uh, the most of the commercially available AI and systems are trained on and work reasonably well on um, contemporary born digital data. So most of the off the shelf tools are built to support business cases and are largely untested on library archive and museum content with the research use cases in mind. So um, uh, a lot of the performance data or accuracy data that are cited in marketing materials or by vendors are often really quite unreliable for the complex tasks and the messy data that, that we have that we're dealing with. So um, to dig into one of our shared challenges about the um, about uh, uh, library, archive, and museum collections. So they, you know, these collections, the digital collections are vast, they're produced to industry standards, they're very high quality, but they also include historic bias, they represent an incomplete record, they're selected from a larger collection, and they're created in different contexts for different reasons. And um, that uh, contributes to um, challenges in, in processing these our collections with AI or ML tools. So for example, this picture here, this was 
Um, this is a, a, an image of a woodcut that was created more than 100 years ago and acquired at our library probably 70 years ago. This is just sort of used as an illustrative example. We probably digitized it or, or we probably processed it 50 years ago um, and, and imaged it and digitized it maybe 20 years ago and put it online 15 years ago. So the, the level of description, the tagging, the resolution, the quality of the scans the, um, and the images, they vary with this um, image, it's gotten through a lot of handoffs, a lot of um, uh, steps to, to sort of have it appear on our, on our um, on our screen. And, and this is just a very small example of the vast collections. And, and what AI and ML do is deal with um, deal with images or um, items at scale. So accounting for the, the handoffs, the decision-making process to create this image um, is, is a complex thing to do in AI and ML. Um, there, it, there's also the, the underlying structure of our collections don't map well to, um, to sort of modern uh, um, algorithmic sort of discovery system. So the, um, uh, so the, that's another sort of challenge that um, that uh, uh, our 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 collections sort of faced for um, these technologies. Um, but the the sort of user expectations for discoverability um, is is going to um, you know sort of be con continue to be a driver for us to sort of figure out how to ride this wave of technological change. So Megan, I'll pass it to you. All right. Well, it may not surprise you because our, we have labs in our name that we believe that experimentation and iteration is really essential for adopting approaches, uh, as well as some of the frameworks such as the one we're presenting. And this slide shows a notional um, idea of moving through iteration and experimentation. And it really makes sense to us and some of the work that we've undertaken. But again, it's just one way of thinking about experimentation. And it's also interesting to think about the difficulty of mapping uh, and predicting um, what you may get when you're undertaking initiatives that integrate ML and AI. And some of those reasons include that resource requirements, risk, complexity, user and organizational needs. These dimensions really are difficult precisely because in our experience, this kind of information is gathered through the process of undertaking this work. Uh, we also want to acknowledge that creating space and leadership buy-in for experiments and pilots and even prototyping can be more complicated in practice than it is on paper. And uh, so we hope that some of the things that we're sharing, the approaches we're sharing can help you to make the case for experimentation. And we think it's valuable here because uh, following, some of you may have undertaken machine learning or AI um, experiments or small projects, and you, this, these um, observations may resonate with you. So at the end of an ML or AI project, it really can be a challenge to immediately assess the impact and kind of define the larger so what or what's next. Um, you may have broader context is missing or you may need more evidence and that can make it hard to move strategically or swiftly to systematic exploration, especially as Abby uh, called out before when resources may not have been allocated for that type of work. It also can be a challenge to articulate the kind of preparation required for broad implementation since the outcomes and practices um, that we are able to see tend to represent discrete projects. So often lacking, lacking a sense making roadmap or framework. And then it can also be difficult to determine organizationally how that work was undertaken. Because again, we hear about project outcomes which are really compelling and the methods employed, but the things that are less foregrounded can include team and organizational dimensions, like the ways that subject matter expertise was integrated, what staff competencies were required and other critical considerations. And finally, it can be challenging to remind leadership and colleagues uh, to remember people over tools uh, to, and to think about the fact that diverse staffs and staff and partners and subject matter expertise really will be essential for adopting AI and ML methods uh, alongside emerging frameworks. And all of these elements together can be better surfaced through experimentation, um, through evidence gathering, uh, determining success criteria and testing that, as other, including other essential considerations that emerge serendipitously, and um, taking a look at the gaps and critically reflecting on the practice. Next slide, please. 
So for the last several years, um, the Digital Strategy Directorate and our team in the Library of Congress Office of the Chief Information Officer mm -hmm. have been exploring and launching experiments, initiatives, and events. And in fact, we're celebrating five years of LC Labs, and you can find examples of our, these experiments on our website, labs.loc.gov. And many of these experiments really have focused on the possibilities introduced when collections data are made machine readable, just as Abby mentioned at the beginning, and um, the related necessary practices to support a range of users engaging with these materials. So specifically in the last four years or so, we've deployed a small, excuse me, developed a small body of ML experimentation and recommendations, and we really have arrived there after hosting events and uh, supporting knowledge exchange, sponsoring experiments and research, exploring user needs from a range of angles, um, and regularly sharing the outcomes of our work. So this slide represents uh, some of that work, including our machine learning and library summit, uh, collaborations like the speech to text viewer and intelligent data analytics report, our innovator in residence projects, newspaper navigator and citizen DJ, the collective wisdom project and humans in the loop. And we continue to investigate methods, models and resources through that type of experimentation and sponsored research and essentially knowledge exchange with peers. However, as we've discussed above, it's become really clear through this experimentation that the challenges of collection scale and users are really complex and nuanced. And um, the outcomes have really enforced that we must continue to assess risk, um, think about what types of resource resources are applied uh, and what are the impact on people at each step when articulating project and organizational objectives. Next slide, please. So the findings of our own experiments um, have inspired some documentation and tools that we've developed, but there is of course a growing and concurrent body of resources and tools um, as, as communities, overlapping communities are sharing their reflections and expertise. And this slide features an entirely non-exhaustive representative list um, from communities of practice like AI for LAM and GLAM Labs, to leading frameworks like Collections as Data, to guides and reports like the Museum and AI Network and the DPC Beginner's Guide to Computational Access for Digital Preservation Practitioners, to roadmaps for AI at organizations like the BNF and Emerging NIST AI Framework. Um, and our own growing set of resources available on labs.loc.gov of, um, and uh, a, a recent page where we've kind of summarized all those things uh, around our machine learning. But many more resources are not represented here. And we think that some of these resources can be even more impactful if we can include them within a framework or a toolkit to encourage modular approaches. Um, in any case, we do want to say how inspired we are by this work of our peers and colleagues. And we ourselves are really eager for feedback and uh, collaboration, particularly around recent form groups that will evaluate AI and ML practice in LAMS with a specific focus on equity and inclusive justice. Next slide, please. So from our own body of work, we have synthesized a set of recommendations. And this slide shows a spreadsheet view and highlights the first recommendation, which uh, has that emphasis on developing frameworks and statements, um, which is one of the reasons we are sharing with you today. So many of these endeavors, uh, this is us bearing the lead a little bit, many of these endeavors were them, themselves informed by the work of the Digital Scholarship Working Group Report, uh, which you can find on the report section of our website. And uh, as I'm finished talking, I'll share some of these links. That report's foundational findings really articulated the essential needs for item level metadata and rights assessment. And all of that is to enhance the usability of our digital collections um, and approaches that require human expertise and computational methods blended together to address the challenges of scale. So very briefly, looking at some of these recommendations, um, you, you may recognize some of them from your own work and may resonate with you. So some of those things include developing a statement of values to guide decision making um, around AI and implementing it in your organization, that there's no one size fits all solution when it comes to AI and LAMS. And it's really imperative, again, this call for experimentation that we're making, it's imperative that we experiment with models and data so we can capture accuracy and share results and assess performance outcomes and, and in particular evaluate ethical considerations within this space. Um, if we are going to integrate uh, human in the loop machine learning approaches, we really need to design those responsibly um, and it, make them engaging and such that they involve expert user and community perspectives. And that operationalizing any kind of AI system or machine learning is really going to require expertise from across the organization and also integrate uh, require integrating more AI expertise within organizations. But there are a few ways to get there. And some of the ways that we've tried that uh, are, includes some of our ongoing body of work, uh, including 
a new contracting vehicle that Abby will share about, uh, some of the resources that we've created, um, and constantly sharing the outcomes of this, this work. And ideally, as you look at this slide and see some of these recommendations, you really are hearing a wide range of skills and the type of staff that would need to be involved in this work. Um, if and when implemented, we think these recommendations would benefit not only the Library of Congress, but also the wider Library, Archives, and Museum field. And um, in, in addition to these recommendations, we have practical resources. So we'll share those with you and um, hope to have some feedback from you. Now I'll hand back over to uh, Abby to continue to talk about that kind of reflection on the intersection of methodological choices, organizational goals, and community responsibility. So um, building on those recommendations that Megan went through, um, the uh, uh, we wanted to um, try to take steps towards creating a, um, a, a framework that would help us think through and make decisions um, on about machine learning, specifically for people, um, for our, ourselves included, who um, are still in sort of a state of uncertainty about how uh, to approach these technologies, how to um, use them and adopt them so they benefit um, our, our, our organizations and our users. So this, um, one of the first things we did was try start creating a, an organizational profile. So the profile is um, a recommendation that came out of um, uh, the NIST Trustworthy AI uh, um, uh, risk framework. So this is um, an exercise um, that uh, that it, um, is recommended that organizations go through and um, or, or sectors. So sectors like healthcare or um, finance or transportation who are currently operationalizing a lot of AI systems have established these kinds of profiles to help guide their um, their sort of regulation of, of the of the, the technology. So we've broken it down here and this is sort of and I should say our organizational profile is based on our organization and it's not necessarily a sector profile but um our organization we work in a national library um uh, we do not have faculty or staff we um we uh, our, our collection does not circulate so the um the way most people um interact with our collections is is through is digital is, is through our digital services so although you can people can come to our buildings and use our collections um the so with our organizational profile in mind we sort of look, took a look at, at um how we might use ai and ml and we we also sort of thought of it as a front of the house versus a back of the house kind of um separation front of the house being um, services that would interact with that our users would interact with back of the house being um, services that our um, our staff would um, would 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 use um, and to manage our collections um, before uh, sort of at making them available to users. So enabling discovery at scale, uh, the section um, uh, um, in the this this four um, four part grid on um, the top left it looks like to me um the uh enabling discovery at scale this is where most of our experiments have have been in so uh generating metadata for items um for uh to enhance search and discovery so this is where a lot of our um our current experimentation is living um and then over here ne next to the um across from the grid is enabling research use so we see this as a lot of the um work that our library and other um, organizations are doing that, you know, uh, um, like collections as data work. So making um, data available for um, users, data, data and data sets av available for research use. And, the, and our researchers, our users will, will most likely use AI or ML technologies to analyze um, the, the content. And, and our sort of role there is sort of making the data available um, in sort of in uh, coherent ways, and then um, providing guides and and um, and perhaps uh, reference support for the for that data. Um, the uh, the bottom two are, are experiments that we are areas we have not really been active in, but see a lot of potential um, or a lot of interesting experiments or um, or applications there. So um, especially in the in this um, bottom left grid of enhancing collection processing data and management for what we're calling business cases. So this is um, uh, managing our content, our digital content um, uh, for digital preservation for um, uh, in 
uh, in a CMS uh, for different formats, uh, um, dealing with large complex formats like um, web archives, what are the, the sort of uh, applications there that we could look into? And then also then the, the other augmenting user services, this is sort of, I think what people recognize available in sort of wider commercial services where there's recommending systems, chatbots, voice search, how, how would those kinds of services um, be applied in, in our organization? Um, so this next piece of the framework is a, um, uh, uh, and I see we're, we're kind of oh, going over time. So I'm just gonna quickly go through these. So this is a framework, this is a, a data processing plan, which includes um, that will have vendors um, fill out whenever they do an AI or an ML uh, um, exper experiment in, in this contracting vehicle that we created. So it includes things that would be on a, like a data nutrition label, it would include it, um, a, a model card, and then also additional information for, that would be particular to our sector, like provenance data and, um, and uh, 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 articulating um, uh, gaps in data. So another tool is this assessment um, piece, and this is looking at uh, each task and um, trying to look carefully at risks for users, uh, risks and benefits for users, for staff, and for organizations. And then um, this is sort of where we're trying to put it all together um, into a framework. And like I said in the beginning, we, we really are looking for feedback and other use cases um, with, you know, that have different perspectives that are outside of our context to sort of uh, test this out to sort of, are, are these uh, ways to engage at sort of the model or data set level, this data processing plan at the task level, um, uh, can we, does this risk and benefit analysis matrix make sense? Um, and then if we, if, if we do do this as a community, what could this, this these sort of tools evolve into? Um, so these first are sort of where we are operating right now in LC Labs, and then further down is a sort of where we really feel like we need the community and sector involvement in building out the, the sort of framework and developing a shared statement of values, uh, building out that organizational profile into a sector profile, and then um, uh, designing um, potential design principles for systems or tools that use these systems. So this is the um, the slot. This is the the uh, the experiment page on our website that sort of co um, uh, is capturing all the machine learning um, work. And um, we're happy to answer any questions. And um, please get in touch with us with, in, in any of these ways if you're interested um, in uh, using any of these resources or um, want to talk about them because uh, we um, are we we feel like this is a, a way that we can sort of uh, uh, move towards certainty in using these these tools in our in our sector. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much uh, for this presentation. Um, for everyone who is um, attending, if you have any question, please do um, type them in in the question and answer uh, box so that we can just uh, collect them there in one place and then. Um, we can actually um, we can actually revisit them at the end of this session. Um, I will, for the moment, um, thank Abby and Megan, and I will call James Baker. I think James joined. Yes. Um, so um, if you can, James, if you can turn your camera on and yeah. Wonderful. Um, so um, I'm delighted to introduce you, some of them know really well, <laughs> James Baker. Um, so James is the Director of Digital Humanities and has been at Southampton for the past year and a month probably or two. Um, so he's going to talk about his experience um, here at Southampton building a digital humanities and uh, a library partnership from a perspective of a faculty. Um, and I will, I think you just muted yourself. Yeah, great. <laughs> I will let you um, get with your presentation. Cool, thanks a little. Right, this is the second time I've been on a panel with Abby and Megan recently talking about very different things, but uh, I guess both times I've underscored why I'm, why I'm committed to working in partnership with library colleagues. So their work is really great. Um, yeah, so I'm James. Um, I 
I've been here at Southampton a year now, and I guess what we're trying to do here in DH is to do what I describe as kind of discipline appropriate integrations of the digital humanities approaches into research education, particularly within the humanities here. And um, I have a line about like, I'm not trying to ram data and code down the throats of the unwilling, but I'm trying to support those who want to explore whilst not letting everyone get away with totally ignoring it. Um, and so, for example, I've just come from three hours of teaching a new module on data environmentalism that we're, we're delivering here at Southampton, which I think is an example of sort of connecting things that I care about in relation to um, data and DH and critical ethics, things like that, to things that our students also care about as well. Um, and we're also an expanding team. Um, I arrived about a year ago, as Eleanor mentioned, as a director of basically no one a building site and a pile of boxes um, with stuff. And we now have a, a space, a growing team, new modules, processes and structures. We have equipment out of the boxes on the shelves and we have sort of our work fully looped into student recruitment, research, grant portfolios, all those kind of things. Um, so I want to use the time I've got today to talk around how our partnership between the humanities and the libraries enabled and fostered DH at Southampton. And then per the brief, going to talk a bit about where this might be going. Um, just as a bit of framing, as many of you will know, I, I'm not a librarian, but I have a history of working in and with libraries. Um, I, I, started my postdoctoral career as a institutional repository assistant at University of Kent at their library for doing Snowpass open access advocacy work. Um, I spent a few years working BL in as a digital curator and really helped that gave me an insight into kind of the role of big research libraries and the kind of leadership role I think at that time with things around sort of born digital in 2013-2015 and getting involved in things like the Big Curated Consortium. Um, I was one of the people who founded Library Carpentry and the software skills training um, regime they offer and I continue to partner with libraries in research in particular colleagues in the British Library and Lewis Walpole Library um, and I'm involved in one of the RLUK research fellowships as a mentor um, around actually things around history of cataloging, around the kind of accounting for the handoffs that Abby was mentioning earlier. And some of you will be supporters of the Programming Historian, which is one of my many hats, and that's libraries are key supporters of our open access publishing work um, via the GIST group in many cases for those in the UK. Which I guess frames the fact that I was really delighted when I applied for this job to um, get an interview for to, um, um, so for the job and then find on the panel a librarian, Wendy White, um, being there. And so when I joined, um, it was also really delighting to sort of see that librarians have been really drivers of the DH project from the start, from way before I'd arrived, and were really sort of deeply embedded with the origin story of the project. So I guess I want to start then by talking about some of the, the practical ways in which our partnership has worked, because I think the very practical things, often that practical structural work is really key to getting things working across campus. Um, starting with the kind of setup, um, as I said, people like Wendy White, Eleonora were really central to the DH project before my time. Um, DH actually occupies at Southampton a, a space on our Avenue campus, which is the humanities campus, just away from um, the main campus, um, that was the Avenue Library. And the project to develop DH drew on data around the use of the Revenue Avenue Library, how it was being used by students. And so what was a staffed service with a collection footprint is now a small co reference collection and an open learning research and infrastructure that is our, our digital humanities hub. Librarians are also really key to the leadership of the project. Wendy chairs the DH advisory group here. And I see kind of Wendy to some extent as the kind of institutional memory of digital humanities at Southampton. And as ever with senior library colleagues, as someone who's like a really vital bridge into the center of the university, how to get things done, how to write a good business case, and really into understanding the kind of longer term changes in our institution that are going on. And I observe this, I, I see colleagues and former colleagues from Sussex are here as well. And I certainly observe this at Sussex as well, when we formed the Digital Humanities Lab, having librarians as part of that was really vital. And um, the role of a library in that was recorded, was reported in the, I think it's 2017, our UK report on, on DH in libraries. So so having librarians as part of that leadership has been a really key part of the, the practical setup here. Um, library, libraries also offered vital support. And I'll, I'll single out, for example, the support of bringing in people from change management to really help us work through the final stages of um, finishing off the digital humanities project, as it were, which I'll come to in a moment. And the library is being really key to the shared outcomes. Um, we have a lessons learned, we have a closure report for the DH project. We're currently moving from a kind of project to business as usual phase for digital humanities. And these are kind of both shared responsibilities between myself and Wendy in the library and Anna O'Neill, head of the library, will be presenting those um, to the university program board as well. And as a final point and a change of picture, 
a slightly scrappy picture is to represent the fact that um, librarians also in a very practical sense near us. Um, this is a, an office down the corridor from the DH hub, which Eleonora does spend some time working in alongside um, some of our research colleagues and will be moving to a different office soon as part of a kind of this growing team. And this is something that I think was really important to happen. Um, it's something I've, I've pushed hard to have defended when it's been queried why library colleagues are working on our estate. Um, in, which is traditionally just you know, where humanities colleagues work now. Um, and to really kind of have that as a space where we can ensure those regular and structured collegial interactions happen between the digital humanities and the digital scholarship teams. There have of course also been creative partnerships um, since we've been here. Um, on staffing, I'll note something Eleonora knows very well, which we slightly borrowed a colleague slash stole a colleague from the library when our technician post came up. Um, it was very much with Eleonora's blessing and one of her members of the team on the panel. But I think having that personal link between digital scholarship and digital humanities is really great to foster that partnership. Um, librarians are also central to the development of the space and particularly the technical estate before um, I arrived and before this technician got into post, helping get equipment investments up and running and documented. And now um, I think it's really important from my perspective to think about how we might recognize some of those library colleagues who play kind of technical roles in essence, how they might link into things like a, a burgeoning university's um, technician community. I also think, the library is a really important partner when we're thinking about sort of delivery and particularly delivery of services. Um, I use the case of 3D printers often here, which is that sort of our kit that we have in DH is starting to demonstrate demand across campus for the sort of things we might be able to facilitate as a university. So engineering students, for example, realizing they can beat the queues in their local capacity by coming over to humanities. Um, isn't our model to provide a service, but perhaps it is a model to kind of think about the ways in which the library could respond to that. Um, and finally, um, working with librarians as researchers is really important to me as well. The RLUK report um, from was it last year now around the role of um, librarians in research really kind of underscored that sorting out the admin is really key here to getting library people on grants. And I don't think our um, new uh, grant system has necessarily solved that problem. Um, but Eleonora is, is a PI on an amazing AHRC funded project that draws on the DH Tech and UKRI investments. And, pulls together and draws in the, the library into that kind of DH expertise and network. And I very much do see the library colleagues as a result as kind of potential co-eyes and bids that sort of complement library priorities where things like research and development, capacity building, evolving kind of like not yet service technologies might be involved. So I think our partnership over the last year has been, been on one hand very sort of um, uh, practical driven and the other very kind of creative driven. And it's maybe reflect that on where we might be going um, as, as a partnership over the next um, next years. Um, I think the first point to say is that for me, DH would not be DH without my colleagues in the library. And I, I'm really determined to entangle the library into DH structures, only of course, if my colleagues are willing, I'm not a weed. Um, but to ensure then that as kind of people, rules, money and life changes, we have succession planning in place for DH and the library to remain aligned. I think the second one is around thinking about expertise and where our expertise overlaps and differs. Um, the example I often think about here is things like research skills and the humanities. Um, how do we complement rather than overlap? So, you know, who does the Zotero sessions with our PGR students, for example? Um, but I guess the more interesting work here is around showing where library expertise is already embedded within the intellectual work of kind of expanded digital humanities. It kind of should be obvious when sort of I put a librarian like Tonya Sutherland in one of their works on a reading list for discussion of archival violence. But I think it's more explicit when we, library colleagues are in the room as experts and figuring out ways of doing that as part of as, as, as we kind of build our education off is really important. Um, and the final one is like the role of the library, going back to my point about libraries being kind of keynotes in a university network more broadly, is about kind of the changing landscape of HG and how we, we monitor change together. Um, example my gift here is around service, for example. Um, I, I try not to see service as a them or an us thing. I see seeing service as something that sits on a continuum from kind of experimentation at one end and routine service delivery at the other. Everything else in the middle is 
kind of shifting. It's dictated by a sort of Overton window of the range of work acceptable to a mainstream researcher as towards one end or the other. Um, and, and DH is certainly not conceived as a service at Southampton. We are not an uncosted nice thing on grants, but then neither should we therefore assume the library is the same. And but the library, of course, has different missions to um, a DH department. So the library being embedded within DH, for me, gives a scope to situate work on that continuum to decide who should lead on what and where and how and others, um, how others might support it. Um, going back to my example of, um, of 3D printers, and they aren't a library service now. Library researchers wouldn't expect them to be a library service at the moment, but I'm sure we can imagine a future where printing a scanned model of a knitted shoe on a library printer is completely comparable to using paper printers to print copies of an article for some research purpose. And how we get there, um, if we want to get there in that particular example, requires, I think, the kind of kind of library and, and DH partnership we've been building um, over the last year at Southampton, but also in that sort of deeper time um, before I arrived here. I think that's everything I want to say. Oh, thank you so much. And I'm going to invite yeah, Megan and Abby to turn their camera on. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. I think it actually summarised and it was a good way to reflect on some of the things that we have discussed as a digital scholarship network in the past two years. So you touched AI and uh, machine learning, but also you talked about skills, you talk about services, the co-design, and James talked about the embedding uh, partnerships in a um, sort of equal partnership between um, library and the faculties. And now we can all be researchers um, in the same way, but just from a different angles, which is things that we have discussed extensively, I think, in the last uh, um, in the last um, uh, few years um, in, through the network. So I do have a couple of questions that came to pop through um, the, the box. But in the meantime, if there is someone else uh, um, also that has a particular questions about partnerships and things that James had discussed, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, so the first question is actually about specifically on Library of Con Congress. And do you see the Library of Congress having a content aggregation role? Um, so one collection for the US and the world, or do you see your role as a facilitating access to Library of Congress, Congress and possibly um, other collection? And this was from Neil Stewart. Um, yeah, thank you for that question, Neil. I think uh, I think our we'll start by saying that our, we have a, um, a, a a vision statement that the Library of Congress is connected to all Americans, um, and that's the all Americans part is partly because we're a, a, a congressional the U.S. Congressional Library. Um, we're part of the um, uh, so that's although we have um, collections and in uh from all over the world but um i think we we sort of look and and that vision i think has been a challenge <clears throat> for for us uh for all the whole uh for all of the library i think um the library has been um the, the library of congress has a you know the, the the because um like i said the lack of faculty the lack of students the, the collection doesn't circulate. The uh, what we have been, uh, you know, building a lot of our systems and capacities and expertise is is, is serving traditional researchers who come to our our, our desks, and um, that's kind of how the system is is built to run. And um, although there has been experimentation, I think in 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 you know in DPLA and other places where uh, content is aggregated for uh, for other users. And I think we've, um, and I think everyone would say the the sort of use of those materials that, that those aggregated services is not has not been what has been expected, um, and the uh, so I think in our role in labs in in this, which is a, a lot of people are working on this, is to sort of think about the users and what users actually want um, from our collections, and to and and with these sort of. Um, tools and experiments that we that we're experimenting with you know are there uses that we can um, uh, facilitate are there um, needs that we can fill that that we're not really doing right now um, yep and I would just add that just as Chris uh, Christy mentioned at the very beginning of this the 
this time period is put an emphasis on the digital and we continue to see that uh, the Library of Congress collection is going to continue to grow so the the challenges of access and use are only going to become more complicated and so bringing people together just kind of building on uh, James's uh, notions of bringing together partnerships and skills acquisition and developing competencies to build on already the the amazing expertise and skills of our colleagues is a, a place that we need to kind of come together to, to put some emphasis on for improving access and use of the library's materials. Thank you. <laughs> That's a really comprehensive um, answer. Um, right, so I'm just moving to a question from Jane uh, for James. Um, do you have any suggestion on how libraries embarking on a DH mission can engage faculties and researchers to partner around creating an innovative DH support service? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, uh, don't be shiny. I think like one of my things is like thinking tactically about when you say the shiny things and to whom. So, um, uh, you know, at the most basic level, like the, I've got education in my head because I was teaching this morning, but like, you know, don't say digital humanities to undergrad because it's kind of pointless, but do say it to the VC because he'll be like, ooh, digital humanities. Well, that surprises me. Um, and I think it's that kind of stuff, really, for me. It's like find find the, the right spaces to have the right conversations. I, 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 I can't can't imagine many of my faculty would be particularly excited if I started to try and tell them I'm going to transform their disciplines through the work that I do. They probably want me to not be there and start lobbying for me not to exist. And I think it, it's those kind of things around pitching, because I think sometimes DH can come across as a bit hyperbolic. So pit, figure out that relationship between humble and shiny. Um, and from there, I think the only other thing I would say is that one of the things I found really valuable here at Southampton is to kind of dig into the ECR and sort of postgrad communities, postgrad research communities in particular, because they often feel like the least supported spaces, the people who are trying to do things but can't get access to a research software engineer because they don't have any budget to do so. And you might be able to, as a library person, tap them into a local research software engineer team, for example, and get them a little bit of time. And kind of those people have been really interesting because they are often in pockets that are unsupported, but and they're and they're dealing with very pragmatic questions of you know like, will my second supervisor and my doctorate like this particular approach I've taken that's a bit computational and it's those kind of things that they need those networks so drilling into them to help sort of create some of those initial networks I think is really valuable. Thank you and I saw Megan nodding so I will imagine that that is also a shared experience or um, something that you experience yourself um, at the Library of Congress. I don't know if you have anything to add or any other suggestions. Uh, I would just say that we we continue to hope to partner with researchers and uh, users of the collection to understand their needs more as Abby mentioned and we have a couple of initiatives that are ongoing where we really are hearing about the the people who are bridging technologies and approaches and different fields and kind of don't necessarily have a home and we would love to help make homes together like build together so what's the future um uh, thank you and then so there is another question for james um are existing faculty and academic librarians part of the h work or has the library employed specific staff to work with digital humanities i'll be really brief here so um I was hired into humanities, so I sit in the humanities at Southampton, and I've been hiring staff that sit effectively under me within humanities. Um, but I think on almost every panel apart from one, there's been a library colleague on the on the hiring panel. I think that's been sort of something I've been trying to make sure happens. Um, and then Eleonora has been involved in the in the library side digital scholarship and sort of parallel hiring. So hiring for specific things the library needs to do, but also that have overlaps with sort of things we want to do. So we are on separate bits of funding, but we're sort of emerging groups and teams kind of like together in a sort of parallel and starting to overlap. I don't know if you want to say anything about that, Eleonora, but... <laughs> No, I think it is mainly to remark the work that we've been doing together to create a complementary expertise and services. So um, we've kind of been cross-referencing and uh, job description or just um, sort of just making sure that we're not duplicating um, and replicating something that's already there, but we're just um, adding value to what is already there by um, having complementary skills or ideas or angles or point of view, um, which was the key um, for us to work with the faculty. Um, so, a, and I, I think I can squeeze in the last question, uh, and it's for Abby and Megan. 
and it's about um, the um, potential offer training. So um, do you or would you consider offering training for using your data and collection for newcomers, um, digital humanities researchers, or do you put your data out and expect users to have those skills? And I imagine James also can quickly chip in with his experience of <laughs> programming historian, but yeah, Megan and Abby first. Go ahead, Megan. Oh, I was just going to say, we uh, actually are very inspired by British Library Digital Scholarship Support and Programming, um, both for staff development and also for wider communities of practice uh, when we began our work about five years ago. But we don't have um, a, a program of support for digital scholarship explicitly. Instead, what we've done is tried to develop resources and share those and continue to understand user needs and improve upon them. So we have, um, I'll put a couple of links in the chat, we have um, a roundup of digital scholarship support kind of guides, uh, including a digital scholarship lib guide that helps people step through requesting and transforming types of data. Um, we have updated and have been working on updating our colleague Eileen Jakeway has been uh, updating the APIs documentation at the library. We have examples of things like uh, Jupyter notebooks and other types of guides that we share via GitHub. Um, and then we also have our colleagues who are sharing about the practice on our signal blog and there's some um, opportunities to kind of look at other methods that have been used. And I also want to shout out our colleagues with the By the People uh, crowdsourcing program who've been making data sets available, crowdsourced transcription data sets available, as well as looking and developing uh, guides for educators and researchers to use that data, which is available on crowd.lc.gov. So I'll put some of those links in the chat. And I just made add on to that really quickly the um, to sort of resonate with James was saying earlier about the kind of, um, uh, and you too, Eleanor, about the combining of teams and sort of um, kind of iteratively going towards a more comprehensive or, you know, sort of more support is that we um, started investigating digital scholarship when we first started five years ago. And, you know, we started with the internal working group and then we, you know, are helping Kluge follows. And, you know, it's been a, a you know, five years of, um, you know, a project here, a project there, a project there. And um, and we and just recently over the pan, um, uh, partly due to sort of really digging into uses of our a B a API versus uses of our digital, our traditional digital collections. And we saw the API usage just sort of really jump, um, especially for our prints and photographs collections. We, um, uh, there are plans in the works now to hire uh, collections as data librarians in our library part of our library. So that um, we see that as a huge, um, you know, to talk about a handoff of we as labs, we don't imagine ourselves being the, the home, the permanent home for this kind of support. We we imagine that being in, in the library reference services and collection services. So um, we think this is a like a huge, a huge uh, win for um, for you know advancing this work and and and, and moving it moving it on to um, more sort of stable and uh, uh, you know comprehensive support. Thank you. That's great. And I don't know, James, if you have last. Comments. I guess the other thing I'd say is that I think the, the question of who owns the kind of trusted training and support around sort of digital data and collections is is a live one, I guess. I mean, with my programming historian hat on, we've been working with JISC in the UK recently, who came to us and said, well, you are a trusted platform for delivering materials that are sustainable. Can you do some stuff, please, on large scale collections? Because you don't have a lot and we think our users need it. And that partnership's been really interesting, partly because JISC came to us with that kind of like proposal effectively, which suggest that to them, there is still sort of questions around who hosts this kind of material and who does that kind of research and training and support. Um, but it's really hard to make, I mean, again, with that hat on, it's really hard to make that stuff sustainable. It's great to have an initiative when you can kind of get it going, but it, making it sustaining is, is really tough. And you know, British Library, have, as, a, as everyone knows, an amazing job of keeping that internal training program going for the best part of nearly 10 years now. Um, and that really takes like substantive investment. So investments in that stuff don't come easy, right? Um, they're not projects, they're infrastructures. So let's kick off the next session. Um, and I'm delighted to have a panel of speakers with me who will be very much reflecting and looking at how different networks have helped and supported um, digital humanities and also digital skills. 
So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor Jane Winters, who's Professor of Digital Humanities and Director of the Digital Humanities Research Hub at the University of London, um, to come and talk to us. And I think she has been significant um, and has led on a wide range of digital humanities funded projects. I think lots of them going right back. Um, but I think today you're going to share with us your reflections around about the work you've been doing with the UK and ARA. Ireland Digital Humanities Association. Sorry, I'm tripping over things here. But can I welcome you, Jane? I know you've been a supporter and have helped RL UK and also the Digital Scholarship Network think around a huge range of issues. So I look forward to hearing um, your presentation. Now that's the slides in, not in present, that's it, presentation mode, thank you. At the end as well. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> we can always start with the end. So let's go at the beginning. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that introduction, um, Kirsty. I don't think I have quite as many hats as James has, but um, but it's getting there. And um, I don't have James's experience of working in uh, libraries, but I think all of my research projects in digital humanities have been partnerships with libraries and or archives. So uh, I'm really going to focus a lot on collaboration uh, in uh, this very short presentation. And as Kirsty said, talking a little bit about the work of the nascent UK Ireland Digital Humanities Association. But I've also got a small local example in my institution, which I think chimes very much with what James was talking about. So we were asked to reflect on some of the challenges um, and opportunities always go alongside challenges. But uh, I wonder perhaps whether the opportunities are themselves not a challenge, and that is the lack of opportunity sometimes for collaboration and work in digital scholarship. So there is undoubtedly a skills gap, and uh, we heard earlier about that in particular in relation to machine learning and artificial intelligence. But there has also been and continues to be, as we've heard, a huge effort to address this through programmes like Library Carpentry uh, and the AHRC, Research Libraries UK Professional Practice Fellowship Scheme, uh, addressing the full range of skills, not just technical ones, but working on research projects and how to develop collaboration, in fact. So I was wondering whether perhaps it's now the opportunities gap that's a bit harder to tackle. And that's also a difficult thing to tackle at a sectoral level because there are so many different institutional priorities and imperatives at work there which determine the opportunities that are open to people. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the kinds of mechanisms that enable collaboration within and outside libraries and how academic researchers in particular can, uh, can work with their colleagues in the library and learn from their expertise and knowledge and exchange knowledge. And really, what are the spaces where people can engage in and with digital scholarship? And that's space in terms of time. But I'm also going to talk a little bit about physical spaces and venues for collaboration are really important. And having a space, again, James was touching on this, shows whether an institution values the work of digital scholarship. It's providing an opportunity for people to engage and work together. Uh, I also wonder about this question of language and um, the, the sort of digital scholarship and, and I hesitated to say versus digital humanities, but they are sometimes talked about slightly separately. And I think that's particularly on the academic side of things, which again is why the work at Southampton is so important. And I've personally found the RLUK definition of digital scholarship to be extremely useful here. Uh, that includes digital humanities, but it goes beyond it and encompasses a wider array of subjects across arts, humanities, social sciences and STEM. And that seems to me like a really useful point of connection because digital humanities is explicitly interdisciplinary in focus and thinks of itself as working across those disciplines. But the humanities label sometimes gets in the way of collaboration and knowledge exchange and sharing. So uh, I think events like this, which bring together people with very different experiences and backgrounds are fantastic for developing a common language for working together and for talking to people in our own institutions, those vice chancellors that we need to convince as well. In terms of space to collaborate, I'm very briefly going to mention a local example. Um, Kirsty mentioned that I'm director of the Digital Humanities Research Hub at the School of Advanced Study, which is quite new. Um, we've only brought together our digital humanities expertise in the last year and a half. Um, and 
it's really led us to address some of these issues about space and time and institutional encouragement, but also support. I think people are often encouraged to engage in this kind of work without giving, being given the practical support, guidance and time to do it. And one of the things that we were very keen to do as, was to establish a physical space. We wanted to have room for conversation and experimentation, a space that didn't impinge on people's day to day working activity. You're not um, intruding on someone's office space or workspace. You have a, a separate dedicated area where these conversations can happen. So uh, just at the beginning of this month, we opened what we've called the Senate House Digital Humanities Makerspace. And there's an investment from the School of Advanced Study in digital humanities, but it's also explicitly not just for us as academic staff and students. And that's why we haven't called it the School of Advanced Study DH Makerspace. And Senate House is uh, the building that we're based in. And we share that building with the University of London's major uh, undergraduate lending library. And it also has research and special collections. And within the School of Advanced Study, we have four national research libraries. And we wanted this space to be for everybody, that it didn't have um, a sort of metaphorical a sign on the door that said, uh, this is for academic staff only, don't come in if that's not you. So it's in a part of the building that's open to everybody. There are no barriers, no gateways to access. Anyone can come in and anyone can book the space uh, for meetings or for teaching and training and uh, just for collaboration generally. Uh, we tried it out with um, a, a conference in the summer uh, when it wasn't still entirely kitted out. You can still see the remnants uh, of a previous activity on the whiteboards in the background. Um, but it worked as a really fantastic venue for bringing people together to talk through the projects that they were doing, to think about data. We have 3D printers, digitization equipment and so on as well. And just in those two photographs, we have research technical professionals, PhD students, archivists, librarians, an independent researcher and university based academics who are all in this instance thinking through how we preserve and make available born digital material. And the makerspace links on to our key lobby area as well. So we often extend out into the lobby um, so that there's visibility for this work and collaboration and people can drop in and see what we're doing when we run events like this. Uh, it's very early days, but uh, it really does seem to have opened up conversations that we weren't having before, that we had tried to get going before with the library in particular, but had failed to do so. And we ran some introductory sessions organised for library staff in the Central University of London ahead of what those for academic staff. We haven't actually uh, invited academic staff in yet. That's going to happen in the next few weeks. We prioritised the library. And that was about bringing people, equipment and knowledge together, as I mentioned, so academic expertise in 3D modelling and library expertise in digitisation and talking through projects we might develop together. Uh, so we're thinking of a set of exemplar projects which are going to be co-designed with a very strong collections focus to demonstrate the value of this partnership and collaboration and communicate that throughout the institution. So these are very low cost in financial terms, and we hope also in time uh, that has to be contributed, but have the potential for high impact within the institution in terms of opening up these conversations. And at a local level, that is what we're going to try to do with the UK Ireland Digital Humanities Association. Uh, this is you'll notice there's no URL at the top of this screen because the website hasn't actually gone live yet. That's going to happen uh, in the next week or so. But this has emerged from uh, funding from the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK and the Irish Research Council in Ireland. They funded a network as part of a digital humanities collaboration scheme. And we had support right from the start from RL UK and Connell, who both wrote letters of support because the network that's led to this association was always designed not just to include academic staff in universities, but people engaged in digital humanities and digital scholarship wherever they were located. That network funding ran from the end of 2020 to um, the end of 2021, so right through uh, the pandemic and uh, various uh, disruptive lockdowns and so on. But we actually benefited, I think, from having our events online and being able to open that up to a wide, diverse audience uh, in a way that might not have been the case if we'd run face-to-face -face events.
So this summer, we published a three year roadmap leading to the establishment of a formal membership organisation by the end of our second year. And the association is going to be open to people who are involved, as I said, with digital scholarship in any sector, whether that's GLAM, HE, creative industries, wherever you might, the independent researchers that I mentioned earlier as well, and with any kind of role. And we're just about to launch a call for proposals for special interest groups. And these special interest groups, we're hoping, will serve as one of the primary vehicles for community building within the association. And it's not about those of us who started off the network deciding what we think of as of interest, but getting ideas from the ground up from the communities that we've been working with. Um, and it would be wonderful, for example, if there were to be a proposal for a special interest group, group around collaboration between libraries and academic uh, practitioners as well. Um, that's just one idea. Um, leading up to this, we ran a series of workshops too, uh, looking at advocacy, teaching uh, careers from and in digital humanities and Christina Camposiori from RLUK talked about her experience of moving from having a digital humanities PhD into her current role and how that facilitates the sorts of connections and collaborations that we want to develop. Uh, so watch this space uh, for the launch uh, of that special interest group call for proposals. And when we're not, we've moved really quite decisively, I think, away from any sectoral focus um, and are focused around a set of core values, none of which will surprise you, I don't think. Uh, inclusivity, community, collaboration, sustainability, openness and transparency and advocacy and action. And all of those map on to the work that goes on in libraries. And we've heard people talking about so much of that today. And one of the really important ones to me there at the end is action, that this isn't going to just be about talking. It is about practical help on the ground, examples of what works, what doesn't work, helping people build these networks and partnerships, the sort of work that the digital scholarship network has shown so brilliantly how to do and will certainly be drawing on a lot of the things um, that you've been doing so successfully there. And as part of that community side of things, I did just want to finish by acknowledging the input from all of the people who have helped to get this work off the ground, both our local makerspace, but more importantly, uh, the Digital Humanities Network, which is now going to become a formal association. Uh, and it will be wonderful as we embark on that association's journey to keep going these conversations with RL UK and uh, with library colleagues uh, across the sector. And not just in the UK and Ireland, we have a huge amount to learn from best practice um, in other countries as well and from other organizations uh, so thank you very much no oh, thank you very much jane that was brilliant um, and again as with the last panel we'll take questions at the end so it now gives me real pleasure to invite anya schmidt who's the director of dance the dutch national center of expertise and a repository for research data um, and prior to that she was also university librarian at a number of dutch universities and I've been watching what dance has been doing for a number of years and um, they always have fascinating work on the go and have done some really great work around about digital preservation but I was particularly blown away when I was hearing the work around about the digital competency centers and a sort of slightly different approach to that digital skills piece that we quite often grapple with so I'm really pleased to have Anya here today to talk to us about the work that they're doing and um, so thanks very much for joining us um, Anya won't be here for the final panel session so please do ask her any questions during this session on you go. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kirsty, and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's a wonderful audience. I've um, also attended the, the last hour, and there's so many things that I recognize in terms of activities, uh, digital humanities um, labs. We had one in Utrecht. We have one in Utrecht in, in, the, in the university library. Um, uh, it's all about um, a collaboration and finding connections and, and sharing knowledge to develop um, this area. As Kirsty said, I have been um, the library, university librarian for over 12 years in Utrecht, and I have since 
uh, July of this year, um, taken on the role of the director of Dance, um, which is an organization that hosts uh, a national data archive, research data archive, but also is very strong in networked services. So this is a national organization uh, as part of the, the Royal Academy of Sciences that has um, a network um, uh, mission and also um, is in the middle of all these collaborations and, and developments. Today, I would like to share with you a very, very new initiative um, that is dance, that dance is involved um, in. Um, I'll talk a little bit, it's only 10 minutes about what it is and a little bit about um, the, the context because as these discussions as we're having today show, this is vital. So this is about um, digital competence centers. Um, I'd like to talk about what is it, <laughs> which are there, what is it, um, and especially talk about the, the, the one in the social sciences and humanities domain. So, okay, what is a digital competence center? It is a place, uh, a virtual and or um, um, physical space that brings together communities of scientists across research institutes, uh, institutes themselves, structures, um, support organizations like libraries, structures like large scale research infrastructures. Um, think of Odyssey uh, in the social um, sciences, um, Claria, you might also me, me, be um, familiar with. So large scale infrastructures, but basically very many organizations and, and people who are working in this area, um, uh, whether as a researcher or as a supporter. Um, it is also a focus point, point for organization and cooperation within the Dutch research domain, but also connected to the inter, to international initiatives. It is, um, whoa. <laughs> Apologies. Um, it is also a focus point for organization um, of data and software and link with available computing. Um, so it's also about um, developing further the um, facilities that are needed. It is supposed to be a dynamic um, um, uh, organization or focus point or community um, and also open to new NEM members and partners, partners. It identifies common needs versus discipline specific issues. There are three um, uh, thematic DCCs uh, envisioned. They are just starting. One in the life sciences, one in the natural sciences, and one in the social sciences and humanities um, area. And dance is involved in setting up and leading um, together with the PIs of Odyssey and Claria, the uh, digital competence center in the social sciences and humanities. What is our focus? Our focus is very much on research, um, reuse of research data and software. That is the key goal um, that is defined in the roadmap for this um, DCC for the, for the SSH domain. It will address fundamental issues that are important um, for large for large parts of the domain and that are not already addressed in any other way. We have heard today of many initiatives that this is typically an area where, where a lot is happening. Um, and the DCC SSH has said, we will try to focus on things that are not addressed elsewhere. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about what that concrete means in a minute. Um, um, it's also, we want to initiate, initiate and carry out collaborative projects to address challenges in further developing infrastructures and services, such as improving fairness in repositories. That uh, we see as a key um, uh, element in uh, enabling uh, and further developing the research, the reuse of research data and software. Um, it's about training programs, um, for, uh, for researchers 
and data stewards. It's about privacy and copacy um, legislation, uh, share best practices and interoperability, organized knowledge graphs and vocabulary. So this, these last things are very concrete in terms of um, how can you further facilitate reuse of research data and software. Um, the last slide that I have for you um, is about the context, because this Digital Competence Center, which is a network organization, a community that focuses on what is needed um, in each of the three research domains, is part of a larger context and many other initiatives. Um, I've simplified it here in this um, screen, where um, there are the three thematic DCCs, and you see on the left side, there are also institutional DCCs. They um, have come about a couple of years ago when um, NWO, which is the, the largest research funder in the Netherlands, started to fund um, little centers in each university and each higher education institution um, to support um, uh, digital scholarship, basically. In some universities, this was already present, in many cases in the library, by the way. Um, so there are institutional DCCs by now in every higher education institution and research institution. Um, then there are these thematic DCCs that are starting up now. Um, and on the other hand, on the right side, you see our National Open Science Program, which of course also has one of their themes about fair data. Um, it should read fair data and software. It's oftentimes forgotten, but it's crucial, of course. But this fair data theme will also um, be very important in developing um, support and facilitation of digital scholarship. The interesting thing um, at this point is that there will be funding for 10 years, um, a lot of funding for the thematic um, DCCs, uh, five years, and um, it will uh, probably be extended to 10 years. So structural um, uh, support with funding on a national scale. At the same time, there will also, there's just been decided that there will be structural funding, and this will be 10, um, also for 10 years, 20 million, that goes to the National Open Science Program. Um, how these funds will be divided um, between the four themes is not clear yet. Um, at the same time, um, it is interesting that our, our ministry basically uh, funds um, development and advancement of facilities um, on the one hand over all the research domains um, through the National Open Science Program. On the other hand, also um, is funding um, thematic DCCs where the communities within research domains will look at what is needed and advance. So there's there's multiple um, ways, at least three, but of course there's another one at least that is the fourth, um, and that is what is happening and can being contribute um, be contributed within the higher education institutions um, policies, for example, but much more. And libraries are part of that. I connected them all in the middle because somewhere <laughs> these initiatives and these funding streams have to connect um, in order to, um, uh, in the most effective way, um, um, uh, develop what is needed for digital scholarship. Um, and with that, I'll leave it. Uh, I'll leave it at this. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, thank you very much. And again, it was great to sort of see that connection to both FAIR um, coming through and data science, because I think that's something we're beginning to see and experience too. So now we're going to come to our next speaker and I'm pleased to welcome back Killian Joy, who I believe spoke at our very first um, Digital Scholarship Symposium. Um, Killian um, is speaking um, and talking about what is happening at 
Connell, um, amongst other things. Um, and I will, without further ado, pass over to you, Killian. Kirsty. So um, hopefully you can see my slides. Yes. Okay, perfect, yeah. So hello, everyone. This brief talk is, I suppose, it's really about the, the key challenges and opportunities for both the Digital Scholarship Network and my own institution in the University of the University of Galway. But first of all, thanks, Kirsty, for the invite and for RUK for organizing uh, this great international event, some great speakers. I've learned a lot um, already. So for the Digital Scholarship Network, I'm talking on behalf of the network's uh, conveners. It's myself, Arlene Healy of Trinity, and Owen Kilfeather of the National Library of Ireland. And of course, the, the wider membership of the, the network um, as well. So Kirsty, Kirsty mentioned um, Connell as well. Connell is the Consortium of Libraries um, in Ireland. I'm a member of that uh, research group and also the National Open Research Framework Infrastructure Group. Um, so I'm mainly working kind of open and, and, and digital research. They're the kind of key areas for me. Um, so like in the few minutes I have, I want to talk about the network um, and some of, the, some of our things we're working on and some of the next steps. And then also, as I said, talk about what's going on locally. I may talk more what's going on locally, um, but I think those things cross over anyway, so it should be it should be okay. So for the Digital Scholarship Network, um, you know, the Digital Scholarship Network, if you're familiar with the RLUK Digital Scholarship Network, they're quite similar, except that the, the Irish version is, um, is smaller, <laughs> the smaller membership and that it's a Connell-sponsored network. Um, and so that means that we're also open to all uh, galleries, libraries, museums, and archives on the um, island of, of Ireland. So I think any organization in Ireland or on, on the island of Ireland that's focused on research active, um, that is research active, um, and that's involved in the development and delivery of digital and open scholarship services. So we're saying digital and open scholarship as well. And like the main aim is really just to encourage partnerships and skills development. Um, across Connell and Glam. But when we set up, as probably, oh God, timelines maybe two years ago, we, you know, we identified key issues and, and commonalities um, across the network by running a series of workshops to like to talk about and to define and to gather member direction requirements. But after this, we did a whole lot of work. And after this, we organized around three themes, common themes that you're probably very familiar with, skills, partnership, and strategy. And, and these themes do represent they represent the main challenge areas um, that came out and ones where we think, you know, we can help, we can help each other. So skills, you know, obviously it's been talked about today and it comes up um, a lot. So in terms of skills, we're doing a couple of things. So we're kind of like in our action plan phase now where we're, where we're, where we're doing the things that, that have just come on the screen there. In, in terms of, sorry, in terms of partnerships, I suppose what we're thinking is what opportunities present themselves you know, as we are working together. So how can we mobilize ourselves, you know, to take these opportunities? And, you know, what we're talking about is shared approaches, you know, in terms of infrastructure, um, funding, you know, all the, all the things that, that we speak about, but how can we action some of these things? So we would, I suppose, you know, at the way this is working at the moment is that there is, um, in, terms of, in terms of outcomes, um, there's a workshop that's coming up quite soon, which is uh, across Connell and Ireland and other um, organizations in GLAM as well. And I think the focus there is really on an ex a shared exhibition platform and what can we kind of commit to kind of getting together um, for that particular solution. And finally, then in the strategy area, we're aware nationally that, you know, that there's a lot of different organizations. Everybody's at a different maturity level in terms of their digital scholarship development. So we've set about to create a digital scholarship roadmap you know, to help people along the way. It's broken into three phases. Um, and of course, the kind of just added on to that is this value piece. It's like, you know, we're constantly asking ourselves, um, why are we doing this? Um, what's the longer term goal? Um, can we define value that translates for our stakeholders and our funders? So where we're at really with that on the network is we're just kind of finishing the action plan. We're hoping to finish by the end of this year. Um, and we're just beginning now to reassess what the challenges are. So I'd, I'd say if I spoke next week or the week after, I'd have a clearer idea of what the network challenges are. Um, we have some initial ideas, obviously funding is coming up. Um, you know, how can we influence and lobby um, the, the funders uh, nationally to, I suppose, to, to consider infrastructure as a key piece? How can we align ourselves in infrastructure? You know, I think on the open side, on the open infrastructure side, there's a lot of strengthening and alignment going on. And that's not really happening on the kind of digital scholarship side per se. Maybe we're just that little bit behind. So what can we learn 
um, from other activities um, that are going that are going on. I'm just going to jump now to the University of Galway Library and um, and what we're doing in digital, digital scholarship. I'm really going to focus on some key challenge areas. Yes. So I was at this slide, I think, and I was really, I think I talked about funding and I was talking about small funding um, grants, you know, for, for a project that you might have, and you might have multiple ones of these um, grants. And then I suppose the overhead that is involved, like it, it's a significant issue, right, for our digital humanities and, and the projects we're trying to get off the ground. It just, it does a lot of overhead. So like, I suppose, consideration there for like, that's the challenge. And then the opportunity then, I suppose, is again on the network side is to to join up realistically, you know, to join up and to have more um, more power in terms of applying and bidding. The next one is 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 around hiring. Um, I don't know if anyone else is having this issue, but at the moment, hiring is is a significant challenge. Um, obviously, it takes time, and the skills are hard to find, and that's always been there. But at the moment, um, probably a COVID um, um, post COVID issue, but the the employee market specific. Well, I, I can just talk for Ireland, really. Um, nobody really, not that they don't want it, but everyone has a better option for like, they don't really want project work for like that last a year, you know, um, especially anybody who is skilled. So it's a real, real challenge to get somebody. So if you're trying to grow and you're, you're basically, you're, you know, you're working with project money, it's, it's a real challenge to, to hire people. The next one is uh, understanding the, the campus. And this is, you know, that's about getting out there. It's about, you know, talking to, to stakeholders, the academics and everything we've been talking about today. And like that constant need to engage and understand the local environment. So we, um, you know, we, we, we've done a couple of these reviews where we have gone out to the campus to figure out what's going on and our, our strategies are built on that, obviously. Um, but at the moment, we are refreshing that to, when we're going back out to the, to the community. Really, I think, you know, we're doing a couple of things in, in this space, um, but we want to see now if what we're doing is, if, are they still relevant? Are we still doing what, what stakeholders want? And it's about... It's about the overlaps that we talked about earlier. It's about, you know, not finding niches, but as things evolve and change, make sure that we're doing everything in partnership. So where can the library help? Um, you know, what is what is digital scholarship? These are the questions we're asking. So we ourselves, we are actually transitioning away from the term digital scholarship more into digital research, knowing that, you know, that uh, teaching and research are often uh, in reality intertwined. Um, but that is the direction that we're, we're currently going in. So that's all about, as I said there, you know, it's about getting out there, you know, make the friends, it's build trust um, and, and it's do things, do things together. I touched on value when it came, when we talked about the, the digital scholarship network and at a base level line, you know, to, to be able to talk about value, we need to be able to find and quantify, you know, the, the, the metrics um, in, terms, in terms of where, how that feeds in to, into value. And for, for us, for digital scholarship activity, that means around, you know, web access. You know, we've a lot of different platforms doing different things. And um, for a particular project, one might be an exhibition or a digital collection or a bit on the website. And how do we actually um, report on that uh, in, a, in a way that is effective and a way that is accurate as well? It's quite a challenge. Um, so we're looking at really at, at, at quantifying and, and how do we communicate value as well. Moving on quickly. A couple of other ones. The first one around prioritizing. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of projects going on. And how do we decide what work to do? And how do we decide what to digitize? So for us, this is a balanced approach between you know program of, of activity um, that's based off you know business plans and things like that, and then strategic projects. You know that just land. Um, business case been quite business cases have been quite useful for us because they tie you know the collection or whatever's going on to the organization and the library strategy. So like we have terms, we strategic trust, like, you know, being digital, open by default, Irish as a language, international impact. And they've been very helpful in prioritizing what we're actually trying to do. In the space, in terms of technology, it's evolving quickly. You know, we all use different, um, different technology and uh, different platforms to do different things, maybe depending on our content. So, you know, open access, scholarly publications for open repositories, publish archives to different things. And... I'm not saying it says I said fra fragmented there in on the slide, but maybe that's a bit strong, you know, in terms of um, these things are connected, but I think they could do with the, a, a, a tighter connection, even on, let's say, the front end or search or even the reporting end that I'm talking about. So we are we are setting um, our sites on unifying or, or, or open publishing platforms. 
um, knowing that there will be different workflows in the background, but trying to make the, the, the interfaces to users much more easy to understand. And we feel we'll get uh, better um, uh, involvement then from the, from the community as well. Two more. Um, the, the metadata one is there because, you know, people talk about digitization as being a lot of work, but for us, metadata is the, is the bottleneck. And it was mentioned already today about item level metadata for 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 AI and, and doing things like that. And that's what we do aim to do as well, item level metadata, but that's that's a lot of work. So there are arguments to be made, you know, do we look at going to file level? Um, and then how can we augment that by using other things like other other data that'll come out, tagging, uh, more relying on OCR. I'm not saying they're perfect, um, but it would increase the, the throughput. Um, and, you know, we ourselves, and we've been talking about using technology and using AI to extract metadata for, for a long time. And we've done some tests and that's what the first uh, talk was actually quite quite interesting. Um, but how do we move from you know, talking about it to, to mainstreaming um, uh, using technology to, to, to help us extract metadata? So we ourselves, we're doing a project at the moment where you know, somebody is going in and they're defining detailed metadata and then we're following up with um, uh, some tools that we're going to evaluate those tools. And we have we have uh, partners on campus that are, that are working on that. And lastly, the space, this is really, it's not a problem, it's an opportunity, um, a clear opportunity, you no know, space, a lab, a center. Um, so for us, we have an opportunity in front of us, that, you know, we're, there's a, we're building a, a new building and part of that is, is a space. Um, so we see it as a place for partnership, you know, where the library can, can work with um, researchers to, to enable their work. Um, I'll reference a colleague in Galway, David Kelly, he's digital humanities manager, and he's proposed some concepts around a new um, digital humanities, a kind of library space that involves a mix between kind of digital innovation, a space for fellowships, that the fellowships then will be placed in that space as well, so not always be a presence. I think all these things are, all these things are, are, are very important. So I think that's me for time. Um, so I'll I'll stop there and say thank you very much for your time. And thank you. Um, if we could ask Kelly Cowton to come and join us instead. Thank you so much, Kelly, for popping up on screen there. Um, so as you may have noticed, we've been hopping backwards and forwards between kind of UK, Ireland and, and Europe, and we're back to Europe again now. Um, and it's with great pleasure that I welcome Dr. Heli Kautenen, who is an executive board member of LIDA, of LIBA, um, and leads on the sort of skills side of things there. And she's also director of the Finnish Literature Society. Um, so Heli, if you could talk to us a little bit around about what LIBA is doing around about digital scholarship and digital skills. Thanks very much. Thank you, Kirsty. Uh, while I'm now sharing my screen, I uh, also want to say my thanks. You can see my slides now. Yes, we can yeah, indeed. Good, Thank you. Good. Uh, so, good afternoon from Cloudy Health. Oh, it's sunny now again. Sunny, cloudy, sunny, cloudy. Uh, Helsinki, Finland. Um, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, this has been an inspiring, I feel quite privileged to have this chance of hearing your talks and, and what is going on in, in UK, Ireland and uh, uh, Europe. Uh, uh, Anya's talk, this is also interesting. And of course, uh, Library of Congress. Um, I'm here, uh, Kirsty, you already presented me, I'm from uh, now pre representing LIBA, the Association of European Research Libraries, and I'm talking about the key challenges from the viewpoint of LIBA strategy. Uh, but I also want to tell, of course, talking about uh, in the context of digital scholarship and digital cultural heritage, digital humanities, I took this photo, this uh, photo here indicates it's from my organization or, or Finnish Literature Society, which is a learned society. Um, and it indicates that my comments are rooted in the research landscape of my own institution, my own country and my own language also to say. Oh. There's something going on here. Okay, so um, 
this uh, society, Finnish literature society, hosts a uh, uh, library, archives, uh, a department of uh, our own with a few digital humanity, humanists, but we also serve the, and we collaborate with the Finnish community of uh, uh, academics, universities, uh, archives and, and libraries across Finland. So this is the background I'm talking about, as well as the, the community of Liber libraries. I've been involved with Liber from the, I think from 2011, and I was elected to the executive board in 2019. Instead of showing the full scale of Liber, I show the mission and values because the topic is the key challenges and the topic is the, the Liber strategy uh, towards the next five years. Liber is, uh, the strategy uh, represents the views and ideas of over 400 Liber libraries, research libraries, of which I just checked that six are from from United Kingdom and 18 from Ireland at the moment. Um, it has been uh, interesting to see uh, that we are sharing the same ideas, the same uh, challenges, the same opportunities. And the next slides, I have uh, two slides that uh, are from the new Libra strategy. And this is the one I use for explaining the key challenges. Uh, we, the process of uh, building the new strategy took, I think it took almost for a year. I was part of the task force from the executive board um, uh, Following along the process, we had a consultant that share, uh, collected the information not only from the from the executive board, who the members of the executive board come from across li research libraries across Europe, but also the Liber community. All the Liber libraries were involved, and also international uh, partner organizations. And um, you can imagine that in the beginning, thinking about the driving factors impacting research libraries in Europe, there were many, many topics starting from the pandemic, starting from the funding, changing economics in Europe, uh, changing situations. But uh, after uh, we were uh, in the process, these three, areas were identified as the key, key factors and key challenges or opportunities. Uh, those with uh, which we in the liberal community and among liberal libraries, individual liberal libraries can influence with our work. The first of them is drive for openness. Uh, the current strategy of LIBA indicates open science and open access as one of our priorities and one of the challenges. And during the discussions, we, not, uh, we recognize that we have not met the goals yet. We have not met the open access goals, although a great deal has been achieved. Uh, the fair data that us, uh, Anya talked about is also one of the areas we need to, to achieve more. Um, from the Finnish uh, landscape, I can say, for example, that in the cultural heritage area, in archives and libraries in Finland, we are also um, finding a challenge of uh, restricted access uh, data, restricted access materials that all are also part of the open science. If, if access to some area of materials 
research materials or cultural heritage materials is not available to our research or our society, that is a gap in this landscape, that gap that needs to be filled. And so this is one of the key areas that, that we uh, consider important. Then uh, all the presentations today, or beginning from the Library of Congress presentation, uh, new technologies. That is uh, undoubtedly a factor that uh, we need to face and we need to tackle the next wave, uh, so to say. And um, we, we can see locally and we can see globally that uh, uh, things are changing. There is a transformation going on and uh, we, in the area of cultural heritage, uh, following, for example, the discussion uh, within the Time Machine organization, which connects libraries and uh, research institutions and archives, uh, there is much to, to cope with. Then the third one, upholding rights and values. That was part of the reason why I chose to show you the Libre mission and Libre values, which the strategy is built on. During the discussions in the Libre, uh, while making the, uh, processing the Libre, new Libre strategy, we many times touch this area that has been, uh, I can see that it has been considered something that has been taken for granted. Of course, we've been discussing privacy, and copyright issues or questions of privacy and copyright, uh, for example, in the relation to open science. But uh, there are there is a need for further uh, or enhanced discussion on this area. Not well during the past years or the, this year, it has been even more obvious that values are to be discussed because they are not that, that they for, for example the technology brings along the questions of ethics and so when we are talking about openness when when we are talking about artificial intelligence and its um, use in the research or its impact in the research uh, for the research integrity we are really talking about values. So these three were elaborated and uh, based on them, these challenges and also opportunities, we, we in, in the new Libre strategy, we identified five priorities which are now uh, visualized in this uh, illustration. In the middle, you can see three of them. Uh, so to meet these challenges and to, to uh, face the opportunities, uh, first of all, there is this uh, engaged and trusted hubs, which um, uh, means uh, or which uh, with which we wish to and we are uh, willing and uh, determined to build libraries as spaces and uh, now a uh, quote mechanism mechanisms of collaboration within the research community with our customers and. Uh, also outside academia and society. The second one is state-of-the-art services. Libraries, Libre libraries are building state-of-the-art services in the coming and Libre, coming years and Libre is supporting libraries in this uh, work. The third one, 
is the advancing open science. As I said, there is still much to do. The, as I said, there are five of them, five priorities. Uh, in the bottom, you see the great gray bar and uh, the upholding rights and values has been identified as something that we really want to address uh, independently and to see how, how it uh, affects the other areas. And then finally, the fifth one is upskilling the library workforce. And today we've heard much of this already. One of the key challenges is on our, my next slide. Uh, we have learned that uh, any, during the past years, we have learned that anything can happen and we are in the middle of transformation. And our strategic decisions and activities should serve the library community and research and society beyond 2027. So it requires resilient solutions and, and activities. And then I've now used my 10 minutes. So I just thank you for your attention at this point. I didn't say that, uh, uh, I just, if I may, I will add to, that all these challenges will be met with, uh, uh, with uh, working groups, LIBA working groups and digital uh, scholarship and digital cultural heritage will be one of the working groups working on these, uh, partic uh, particularly or in the beginning with uh, the skills development. Yeah, um, so the, uh, this last panel, um, well, first of all, thank you for everyone rejoining us with you. Um, coffee and teas or water, whatever you're having to drink, um, refilled. Um, so we're going to uh, start the panel discussion with a um, quick summary introduction um, from Rick um, Mulligan, um, who is a, a digital scholarship strategist at the Carnegie Mellon University. And um, we love, everyone loves his title, uh, for his sense. So he's been working for many years uh, um, in the area of digital scholarship. And it will um, introduce um, um, the conversation and discussion in the panel, um, just giving his point of view on um, how digital scholarship have evolved um, across the pond. Um, so adding some of the conversation and um, that we had the, at the beginning um, of the symposium, but also reflecting a little bit on what has been um, discussed so far, which is a, a lot of area of commonality um, through our way of um, thinking and approaching. But I will leave um, the, um, I will let Rick to turn his camera on and just give us a quick, if he's back. <laughs> yes. Well, oh, thank you very much for the introduction. It, um, and the invitation to come today. And you've not really carved, it's such a small thing you're asking me to do to sum all this up and to give you an overview of North America. Hmm, uh, let's see what I can do in five minutes, right? So again, I really appreciate the opportunity. And actually as a point of interest, my last conference travel and discussion of digital scholarship in national and international scope was uh, the 2019 RLUK event in London. So a lot, I'd say a lot's changed, shifted. No, actually mutated over the past three years, at least from, uh, the perspective I've got, uh, pers uh, sorry, perspectives in the U.S. So I've learned a lot from listening to all of you today. Um, in fact, I'd even kind of hazard a very sweeping statement that some of my colleagues and former colleagues will bounce me for, is that uh, the trajectory you're sketching um, in Ireland, in the U.K., and in Europe, you know, looking at both um, Scandinavia and Dutch, so at least let's say Northern Europe, is along the trajectory that uh, I see in the United States along those of the more mature library-based centers for scholarships such as, say, the Scholars Lab at uh, the University of Virginia or the Center for Digital Research and Humanities at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln um, and other institutions that are working to integrate their faculty using cluster hires for digital humanities or digital scholarship along with their personnel in the libraries, such as uh, Northeastern University in Boston, for instance. Um, you know, tremendous work and a lot's been learned over their 20, 30 years of experience. 
others are doing new things. Uh, I'd especially call out the Studio X initiative that's under the directorship of Emily Sherwood, a former CLEAR fellow at the University of Rochester River Campus, where they're working intensively with augmented reality and virtual reality as part of this extended reality. Um, but largely, I guess what I'd, I'd offer as a personal view is that I believe digital scholarship in the US is at an inflection point. It's been triggered by COVID, divisive national politics, social movements, and the war in Ukraine, among other things. So in many respects, I guess even before COVID, for DH, collections as data, cultural, cultural heritage collections and such, um, even many social sciences, there'd been the shift to this important ambulated focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. First among practitioners in many cases, then funders, and finally, somewhat reluctantly in some cases, university administration. I'd say this shift continues and it's also changed. Which faculty, which libraries and collections, and even which universities are pursuing research funding and where they're putting their resources toward the sustainability of their current projects. Um, I'm seeing that through anecdotal evidence that I'm catching from friends in the NEH, Office of Digital Humanities, but also the NEH Public Humanities projects more broadly. Uh, other things said by the Institute for uh, Museum and Library Services and even by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, for instance. So from my perspective within an individual, you know, particular institution who's been operating remotely for 30 months, this COVID mutation is, has really altered digital scholarship pursuits and even the communities of practice in the United States. So kind of an odd highlight I'd offer here is that in many respects, those of us who are working digitally, who are very familiar with using Skype, Zoom, other tools to operate remotely and virtually with colleagues on projects across different libraries or institutions. Okay, COVID happened, shutdown happened. For many of us, it, it did change our work. We worked more, we worked harder, we worked longer hours. And I don't know about many of you individually, but I also found that those of us who were experts in this area were often asked to do unofficial work, such as teaching everybody else how to use the technical tools. Uh, in many cases, asked to take over project management, asked to come up with best practices or better practices from everything from how to talk to a camera to how to plan for a session. Um, and again, I won't speak for many, but this kind of recognition, or I'm sorry, there's a lack of recognition for just the amount of effort that many in the libraries and those operating digital scholarship did. Many were operating in two different roles, sometimes three different roles as faculty, as researchers, and as infrastructure, human, you know, human infrastructure. This is kind of hit with a digital backlash, I'd say, particularly in the last year, where at least in the United States, many of the smaller libraries, many of the tech-based libraries have had to shift to put feet on the ground, as it were, people face to face again to prove the value of the library, the necessity of the return on investment for the funds going to the library, because many in the sciences and STEM, again, overlook the library, look at the databases, do not see them connected to humans. This has kind of had some backlash on the digital practitioners who are now, in many cases, having these policies imposed broadly to say, you too must be in the office and interacting face to face. And this has been met with some resistance by those going, hey, I'm maintaining a Zoom session with 15 people on two continents. I can't do it face to face. So you want me to come into an office where I spend all day virtually? Uh, can we talk? Now, I'll tie that in with part of this backlash is, it ties in with what uh, Killian was saying. There have been some tremendous personality, uh, personality, sorry, personality and personnel shifts. Um, just the list of open positions that I've seen over the last two months has been somewhat staggering. And I wish several of them had been there uh, three, four, five years ago for colleagues who have given up in academia because there had been nothing for them in faculty roles, in research roles. There had only been project work. There had only been postdoc work. So this is a shift, but it's not, I believe Killian hit a point, that people couldn't afford to wait around. So they've gone on. And in many cases, the graduates uh, graduate students, graduate assistants, and even postdocs, again, had to leave academia. Some have been able to go to institutions. Library of Congress has been a favorite destination for many. Uh, National Endowment for the Humanities in the US, uh, even some of the funders, Andrew W. Mellon, Sloan Foundation, regionals, uh, arts and humanities councils. And I know a good many who have returned or gone to industry, Google, Meta, Amazon, uh, especially those that were jumping before Ukraine was invaded and uh, before the talks of recession. 
So this kind of churn has really shifted where some of the attention's going, where some of the resources are going. And I'll even argue some of the expectations of administration, libraries leadership, uh, there's been a disjunction at many institutions between university administration and libraries leadership and how they see the resources being deployed or who needs the money. And broadly stated, what I've seen is a lot of shift to focus on data, open science, open data, research as data, data as collection, data as everything, um, and kind of a shoving of the social sciences and humanities into its own little pigeonhole and something that's trotted out when a funder wants to give it attention or money. Sorry, I am being the pessimist in the group. I thought it'd be nice to, to offer that because this darker side of the inflection point is really what I'm hearing by a number of disheartened colleagues, people who really worked hard leading up to COVID, throughout COVID, and found themselves either cut loose, cast adrift, or just overlooked. As I'll say even locally, a lot of attention is going towards funders who can give us money, who can give us money. And a lot of it is tied to physical installations, buildings, large projects that are tying in with, in some cases, the National um, Science Foundation and others, but not in a way that really recognizes the groundbreaking work that digital humanities and digital scholarship and the social sciences and arts have extended things and made so many of the materials available during COVID. Again, speaking for our institution, we had students who could continue projects, uh, remote work, but also courses using digitized collections, working with TEI, text encoding initiative materials, collaborating with colleagues across the state, but also internationally, in some cases, you know, say the equivalent of the uh, sister city model to work with other faculty, especially, I saw some of this with the US and Europe and students being able to interact with peers in this way and do group work and publish it on Omeka, or even WordPress for that matter. And they're now using some of that as links to their digital portfolios. So all these broad things also tie in three challenges that I've seen coming up and much sharper. Uh, one of the issues we've had at CMU has remained uh, discovery, accessibility, and digital publishing. So issues with the infrastructure, uh, digital scholars ability to crawl publications, open access journals are one, but also journal like publications that often this is limited by the local infrastructure and no dispersions on Google itself, but when they get enough bad links or have problems with the XML or problems with even the Apache web server configuration, they just start ignoring that server and sometimes even that institution. And I know that this has been the case for some libraries that have just been written off by Google Scholar because they can't make their way through the tech wall. Um, in a similar fashion, sustainability has been an increased tension for us that we've looked at the research life cycle, offering resources, um, been pulled into the role of funders, even the PI, the, the principal investigator's career and their choices. And we've seen again, the, the case, the history of projects trailing off rather than being retired in the sunset with any intentionality. And part of this is we've started, and I don't think it's gonna go very far to be blunt, trying to develop the idea of critical project metadata that incorporates an IR institutional repository deposit of flat files, but also that critical metadata to create a DOI for a project. But even though that creates a historical presence, there's still no aggregated DHRS project or funding registry. It, I know we talked about this briefly in 2019, still haven't seen much done with that, but so we're losing a lot of this historical work, new tools, new projects. And that ties in with digital preservation more broadly, where even work with the Internet Archive is under assault. And others, such as uh, the rhizome.org and their work with the Conifer um, web app that actually tracks web services in the browser to record not just the content of a site, but the activities of a user. That's a tremendous thing. But again, it runs into the same problem that we don't all have a shared infrastructure for storage, even though cloud computing and the costs have been dropping. There just is not the individual institutional um, interest or funding line. And the US, unfortunately, does not have an, a group such as our UK. So we are operating very much on individual responses. And often that's driven by funding and the lack of funding or the loss of funding by various uh, issues with investment, let's say. So I think that's 
kind of enough to hit you with as a quick overview. Thank you. That was a good summary overview. I did touch so many. <laughs> and I yeah. apologize. I didn't realize my camera was off. <laughs> we didn't want to stop the flow. Because uh, I know it's, it's really difficult when somebody's presenting to stop but just worried about something else and then go back. So we didn't want to stop you because uh, it was so interesting what you were doing. Uh, so, Kirsty, you have your hands up. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really, it was kind of, you had definitely a more pessimistic kind of tone to it. And I think, again, it was that interesting reflection around about digital skills that I was sort of touching on at the beginning. We're all now much more digitally able, but actually that digital ability sits in a, sits at a particular level and it's not really around about how you do how you do text and data mining or how you do some of the much more kind of sophisticated searching that we need to do. And I think what was interesting in all our kind of, sort of reflections that digital skills piece is still a real challenge because yes, we can all use Zoom now. We're all much more better on Google and Teams and you name it, but actually we still don't have the skills to do certain other activities. And I think that other piece that you touched on at the end, and again, a number of others were reflecting on, and we had a sort of question in the chat earlier, is that that digital infrastructure piece, how do we get hold of the collections? Um, there is no national aggregator, and I suspect, you know, I'll be stunned if in my lifetime there is a national aggregator that brings together all digitized collections with all their challenges around about equity and diversity and inclusion because of what's been digitized when. So I think interesting that we're still at that point. So I think my question to everyone is that digital skills piece, how do we move up to that next level? And how do we collectively come together to make a difference on the infrastructure piece? Just a few small questions. Does anyone want to pick that up and try and answer? Jane, you've got your hand up. Jane first. Because uh, I think Eleonora was ahead of me if you want to come in. No, it, it was just a, a reflection, but Kirsty has um, asked a, a good question, so please. <laughs> Um, it's really on, on the skills side of things. And I should say that I'm based in a humanities only research institution that has a national role in the UK to deliver research training at the postgraduate level. And um, we, this is not a solution, it's, it's kind of adding to the difficulties, that the, the real problem is the tension between trying to raise the skills base across the board but also simultaneously trying to train people to deal with um, the really, uh, to be at the, the cutting edge of where the digital skills are needed. Um, and that, you know, that's a sort of stepping over the group in the middle who have got part of the way there, but haven't made it all the way. Um, and we certainly haven't found um, a way to crack this. And uh, it's very hard, especially if you're trying to deliver introductions to particular kinds of digital skills we find. Um, to get the level of that right, to encourage the people who really need it. And there's also a shortage of people to train at the advanced level in universities and for the humanities too. So I think that investment in trainers and developing the skills that there are in libraries to be involved more in, in these training processes as well. But it, it feels like something that's not going to go away. We've been talking about it for such a long time and the, and the edge of where we need to be is always moving and is always going to move. And then there are people getting left further and further behind. So that's kind of just adding problems rather than a solution. But I, bridging that gap between the really highly skilled and the people who just need a, a step up onto the ramp is quite hard. Right. So who's going to pick up from that? Eleonora or Rick next? I think Rick was first. So actually, uh, to kind of bridge the two, I'm thinking of uh, what was said about, especially the Dutch model. So for what it's worth, I attended uh, James uh, Library's uh, carpentry when they were presented at the University of Pittsburgh when I first started at CMU. And I'd say they're a tremendous tool. One of the difficulties we found at CMU is that while libraries personnel can take these and some have a proficiency or develop it, they don't have the time built into the way they work to actually maintain that proficiency. I'd say this, and I'm coming from having been software industry in the late 90s during Web 1.0 of all things. A lot of the problem is that a lot of us pick up the tool we need at the time and forget it six months later as we move on. 
So it's almost a necessity for us to recognize structurally how the libraries have this digital component that is now part of how we work. And I guess compel, convince uh, leadership that it's not just professional development as a class, but it's closer to the certificate training and even certification testing for us to develop these capacities and maintain them over time. It might require some something along the lines of us developing homework, project work that is integrated into the assumed time that one works over the course of a week and not just, oh, you'll do it at night, you'll do it on weekends. Uh, yeah. I'm poking fun at certain administrators right there. No, but and I think that, I don't have an that answer is a for common it. challenge, that kind of where do we find the time when the day job is already um, slightly fuller than the hours um, we're supposed to be working. Eleonora and then Killian and Megan. Yeah, so it's kind of similar to what um, Freak was doing. So we see, we're seeing a lot of um, embedding. And again, this I'm stealing um, some of the things that James will know, and I'm sure <laughs> he's raising his hands probably to make this point. But it's just a lot of work into embedding those skills into curriculum so that we train our students to be the next generation off. And we still have the gap with the people that are currently doing the job. They need to make sure that our data is prepared, data is is prepare for um, AI, which um, is how do we how do we make this happen? Because we know the training actually takes time and it's not just uh, your 10 day short development course. And that is you're going to be mastering coding. It actually takes time to develop the skills, master them and also uh, apply to your day to day job. And I'm not sure as a library, I mean, that that was my initial question. Have we done enough to make sure that staff has time to develop in the same way that we are developing our students uh, and developing their career. Uh, but again, it's just um, throwing out there and it's, it's mainly looking uh, um, introspectively of what library have been doing in the past, um, apart from developing some skills in informal training um, and um, what, how can we maybe take this forward? But I will shut down here. Killian then. Thanks, Sarah. I'll try and answer maybe a bit on, on a bit on each, but a bit on the infrastructure and the skills. So the, the skills one is interesting because like it can get very complicated very quickly. Um, but I think like the base level of having an ability to work with structured data, um, and then you can build on top of that. But like that's a core skill that isn't always available. And we've tried a few different things in the past, and I think we're coming around to the idea of a you know of this carpentry library carp going back to that really and saying right there's. This is excellent, um, and this, this why change something that is that isn't broken and that is very effective at delivering those core Unix skills, uh, data skills, and then you know building on, on on top of that. So I think we're kind of going back to that on the on the on the skills side. <laughs> Thank you, James. Um, on the on the infrastructure side, it's really uh, I touched on this. I won't I won't go too much into it because I know we're talking about skills. Um, but I do think we, and I mentioned this, I do think we have something to learn from what's going on in the open publishing sphere in terms of wh how we could align and strengthen. I'll use words like that. Rather, you know, there's different models, of course, like, you know, you can have a natural repository, you're right, <laughs> I do, that's a challenge. Or you could have a strong um, network of repositories that are aligned in some way, whether that be, they have to be aligned in some way or else it's not going to work. Um, like, so you could align on, on some way on metadata or you can as you kind of as you I think you use the word Kirsty aggregate. Um, I think you're stepping into a lot of crosswalks and a, a, a lot of messing there. I and mean, it would be better if you kind of went to source and and looked at the the metadata approaches at a more granular level and try to align some way um, on that. Um, I know that gets challenging as well. And then there's triple F in the mix as well. Um, that's one way to to align as well um, in terms in terms of being interoperable. So yeah. So yeah, just some ideas. That's great. Megan, and then we've got a question from the audience as well. Great. I'll just add in a couple of additional ideas in the mix and really within our own context and some of the things that we have tried in our uh, LC Labs team, which is a group of people who are trained with a range of different backgrounds and we work really collaboratively with colleagues. And um, one thing that we found in bringing people into our team is the complexity of context setting of our own organization. So transferring uh, frameworks and models from other types of organizations when people join us uh, and trying to have them learn really quickly um, you know, that kind of context has, has often been a tension. Uh, so figuring out a way to kind of bridge um, and see the value in the transferable skill sets from other disciplines or other organizations and bringing it 
into our spaces. Uh, some things that we have been trying to do as well are details and exchanges. We haven't hit the exchanges part quite as much. So if anyone wants to host us, let us know. But we have been using some of our resources to try to uh, support um, skills development and professional development for colleagues while also trying to bring in um, trying to piece together gaps and bridge gaps that we have within our, our own context. So we've been doing this within our Computing Cultural Heritage in the Cloud Initiative, for example, and some of the other work. Um, but I will say one more thing about the, the types of opportunities. I've had the opportunity to be uh, at the intersection of programs that are um, really can be the the place of interdisciplinary engagement so in particular crowdsourcing programs at the smithsonian and at the library of congress where you have an opportunity for um the the long and um you know well-rooted types of practitioner skills at the intersection of new skills and different types of ways of communicating. And it really could be an incubator. Those types of programs could be places of incubating uh, transferable skill sets. So maybe trying to think about how we can piece together these different types of programming through details and exchanges, um, and also thinking about the way our job descriptions can um, articulate transferable skills or, or call out transferable skills more effectively. Some ideas to think about. No, that's really great. James, I'll pull you in next and then I'll go to the, the question on the on the QA. I think to some extent it also links to the question because like it strikes me that a lot of this is about like whether it's about infrastructure or around training, it's around professional personas. Um you know, I've been working recently on some like histories of like cataloging and museum studies and you know this moment in in the 70s when suddenly people got excited about information management and then it kind of just like drops off the radar from a professional persona and gets shunted into kind of kind of feminized clinic clerical work for example for a bit and so curators don't see documentation via computation as part of their job because oh it's been done and it's been done by those people over there um and it strikes me as similar things are with kind of skills to some extent as well um I, I i found out recently that you know people like um the folks who do the the glasgow kind of um information management courses you know i you know, they do wonderful wonderful work only recently added in digital preservation now i'm sure that's not i'm sure they've wanted to for a while right but the fact that's quite recent is really striking to me um but then there's also like the professional personas sort of lead into the kind of default things that we do. So when I was at iPres, I went to a lovely preservation um, presentation by a guy, I can't remember his name, who um, had used a wiki base as a trusted source for preservation metadata about software. And that was just like, well, of course I do that. That seems like the sensible thing to do, but that didn't strike me as the kind of natural necessary decision of someone who's a professional working in these spaces. People might have thought of something else to do. So, I mean, it's about, so the, the choices of infrastructure that we use and the choice of skills that we have come back to the professional personas that people think people working in these spaces do or are. And I think I can't help but think they're intimately connected and it's intimately connected to how, how I think every day and how people look at me and they don't see necessarily perhaps what I see, think I see when I think about my own persona. Um, so that's really interesting because again the question from the audience is with regards to skills and skills gap is the problem ownership of the training and I think again we've alluded to library carpentries which is kind of open source but it needs to be maintained and you've talked about the programming historian James and then what's happening there with JISC that's also really interesting but you're right it is around about where does this and we all institutionally develop training and again I thought it was really interesting Megan and Abby that you weren't you know do yes you're providing an signposting to the training but you're not actually developing an in-house training um, system which again we've seen Cambridge um, and Oxford also do around about that sort of digital scholarship piece and it is that we are sort of all struggling with where do you go to get the training and the skills who owns it how do you get access to it who will pay for it which I suppose in an interesting way mirrors almost what Killian was saying around about the infrastructure and I was sort of talking aggregated but I was just thinking most of our infrastructures just don't talk to each other which is why my sort of pipe dream of being able to download everything that's digitized and do something around about that is just feels like a pipe dream um because we can't agree quite often as a profession and across kind of countries and I think that's my other reflection we can maybe the Dutch is really inspiring but that's in a country they've managed to get agreement 
how do we do that on a bigger scale when we're in a larger country or we're working across Europe and across kind of boundaries? How do we get that agreement? Is it us as a community working together to do that upward action? How do we get our governments to even engage and agree that these things are good? Um, you know, and how do we make that happen so that we can collaborate more easily, you know, and have these networks of support and help each other to kind of move along a little bit further? Don't know if anyone has any further thoughts on those. I like asking small questions just so that we can, you know, and it's the end of the day as well. I know you're all going, oh, right. <laughs> but Heli and Rick, um, in fact, Rick, I think you had your hand up first and then we'll come back to Heli. All yeah. I was going to mention briefly is that there are experiments out there such as the emulation service infrastructure and some of the software preservation network, just in terms of hardcore with metadata and actual code and such, um, that tie in with what was just said in terms of somebody using Wiki, somebody else using, oh geez, back in the day, SourceForge or GitHub, that it's again that, that kind of lack of standardization. So instead of hitting that drum, it's more the issue that the community is still so very disparate without recognizing that they often have alliances, such as say here, the Digital Library Federation with the, um, what is it, the National Preservation Network, or Digital, sorry, Digital Preservation Network, that they often don't see where they have alignments. And I, I'd, I'd say this is the curse of libraries and academics, broadly. All of us tend, especially humanities, social sciences, we tend to pursue the answer to a question individually. If we have some broad-based background, we often recognize that there are experts to whom we can direct a question if we can't find the answer quickly. And this is kind of a problem within libraries. Librarians try and get the answer and then provide it as a service without recognizing the collaboration necessarily. And even in DH, while it is incredibly collaborative. Right. And I think Rick has just us there so we'll move over to Heli. okay thank you yes uh, rick was frozen okay actually my comment is uh, uh complementing or building on rick's com uh, comment um uh it seems to me uh that in the we, we are seeing seeing overwhelming obstacles if we look at the all the things that are happening, in particular about uh, the skills and, and so on. I would like uh, being part of the Libra community for me, I I'm come from a small, small library. I come from a small language area, a country that is, well, at the moment, uh, there are even bigger obstacles in our society. So if I were to think that the obstacles are something depressing, I would go home and uh, uh, take the blanket over my head. Instead, I collaborate. And I think that uh, uh, I said that in Libra, one of the values is inclusivity. Thinking that diversity is also a strength for us. Uh, so not thinking the overwhelming obstacles, but thinking about the, in Finnish, we have this word sisu, which is combined determination, guts, and hope. So in one word, that's, if we think that something is important, then we collaborate. And in libraries, we are really good at that. And now we, uh, we can even cross the borders more easily than 190 years ago when my uh, association was built. Uh, I have to say, I like that, that guts and determination. I think that's something we should all take away. Guts and determination to collaborate and work together. Abby. Um, I was just going to touch on the uh, the sort of question you posed at the um, about the, uh, you know, sort of getting buy in or agreement to, to sort of move forward and um, the uh, we mentioned in our presentation, but I think looking at the mechanisms of how uh, this work gets done, in our context, it's we work with contractors and vendors and we have contracts. So in those we, um, so, and we've just created this contract for experimentation 
that um, we'll uh, be able to use for the next five years. And and in it, we, and we, the sort of broad um, areas are uh, research and reporting, and then um, prototyping and experimental data transformation. And um, and in the data transformation, we're having contractors fill out this data processing plan so that we can document performance and how, um, you know, how, uh, what the sort of expected performance is, what the actual performance is. And so we can get a better, uh, a, a more um, uh, granular and sort of solid understanding of what quality means. And I think that's, um, and thinking about like the FAGI, um, the federal uh, agency guidelines for digitization, this is another tool that, um, that uh, federal libraries use, and I think other libraries use to uh, express the quality standards and express what um, what we expect, what um, how these systems perform for us. And um, I think embedding our uh, needs in in you know our values in these mechanisms can can help, um, and and it and it and it can be sort of boldly stated, or it can just be stated in sort of a business kind of way, which sometimes is more kind of palatable but the um and then the other thing about the training so the first task order that we're doing under this mechanism is a experiment to see how um if we can create a mark record from an ebook uh, or digital content so this and this experiment um you know we're have we're asking the vendor to test five at least five models and three of them have to be open source and we, we're going to share all this data publicly and um and we've and instead of and we've done sort of general machine learning kind of ex, uh, presentations at the library, but the um, but this involving the catalogers from sort of day one in in designing this experiment and talking about what they want from it, what their you know how this can help their sort of work lives has really made it so it's not like a training exercise, but including them in sort of the design of the solution is um has been you know it's been great there's been lots and lots and lots of interest all positive um and people are very excited about it so i think like that sort of including them in the solution not just you know like we'll train you how to do this um i think is a slight sort of shift that has worked for us Eleanor, you were just saying there's a question in the chat, yes. which I'm desperately trying to find, but cannot. Sorry, I was trying to uh, unmute myself. Um, uh, there is just a question, um, stepping outside of this conversation for a second and talk about digital humanities and outside digital humanities and social science. And it was mainly to the panel to know if there was any collaboration that you're aware between research libraries and healthcare. So anything that is in collaboration to NHS or the Health National Service. Um, so if you are aware um, of any um, initiatives or anything new, because it's true, we always talk about social sciences and um, um, engineering and humanities and sometimes not always NHS, but um, oh, I can see a couple of um, um, things have been posted. And yeah. then there was another one at the, yeah, sorry, Abby. I was just going to say, I don't know anything specifically about that, but in the um, NLS, the National Library of Medicine in the US, there's a, um, there's a role there um, for the, uh, uh, that I forget their, his title, but his role is to sort of um, think about the history of medicine in in the so there's been a lot of DH projects that that role has sponsored and some of them are there but that would be a place to look. Um, and I think the National Libraries of Scotland is doing something as well with Welcome and various others looking at uh, medical health and Jane you're nodding do you know a bit more I'm just trying to remember the details of the project but I think um Sarah Ames at the National Library of Scotland is probably a good point of contact. Um, um, it may not be the same project, but the Archive of Tomorrow, which is working, it. with, yeah, it's um, a collaboration with Welcome, I think is giving some funding to it. 
to look at uh, web archive collections in the national libraries and how they can be made um, open and usable and all the questions around misinformation and so on uh, it, around COVID. Um, and that's going to be a, a wonderful collection and it's pushing at some really interesting um, things around copyright and privacy and ethics, which are going to have really wide ramifications for working, not just with health data, I think, but, uh, but with all of those digital archives that have got so much personal information in. So so yeah, Kirsty, that's that's a brilliant project, and that's only just started. So I think the findings of that are going to start coming out very much. So and I think again, um, I think the University of Edinburgh is involved in that one too. Um, I'm just conscious of time, and I noticed Killian, you had your hand up earlier, and then it popped down again. Is there anything else you wanted to pick up on, reflect on? It's back to infrastructure again. I love infrastructure. Um, Me too. I'm with you on that, <laughs> and it's such a conundrum. Exactly. And it's complicated um, because like it means different things when you say it like and, and even if we just think even about the platforms of technology and enabling enabling research and, you know, if we talk about experimentation, are we talking about building infrastructures to enable um, experimentation during the, the research cycle? Or are we more focused on the endpoint publishing? Uh, two different completely case, two different complete com different solutions, I think, at this moment in time, which is which is troubling. And then also. If you focus on data, you know, then I suppose, you know, you could say that data publishing um, in essence is solved and data stewardship needs to be a bit more robust. Um, and then preservation comes into the mix as well. But I suppose I was just going to call out some, again, I'm going to, I, I've looked at this, I've looked at the open area quite closely recently and I'm looking at the endpoint in terms of publishing and like there is some good examples of, of how it can be done on that side. And I just feel um, that in terms of the, the endpoints for digital scholarship and where they might end up in terms of from a library perspective if you're thinking of something in a repository um things like things like open air do you know like so that's like that's a that's a, a way of, of of alignment uh eosk as well on the european level and things like that so these are all things i think that we can look at um just try and save ourselves um jumping through hoops Right. Well, I think I'm just really conscious of time. Um, and I think um, we, we might begin to sort of round up there. I think what's interesting, thinking back to three years ago and where we are now, there are some challenges around about infrastructure and actually the sort of skills within the community that we're still facing. And I think we it's interesting, the discussion has very much moved on, though. Three years ago, we would not have been talking about artificial intelligence, collections of data, and the way that we are now. So I think we definitely have moved on um, and there's definitely progress. I think what's interesting is that COVID has brought us a whole, yes, people are more digitally aware, but those really sophisticated skills, they're still needing to be trained. And actually we've got so much more demand on our staff that that kind of keeping staff upskilled, maintaining those skills, because I think everyone's reflected, we need to practice and use these skills regularly, is a real ongoing challenge and almost has gotten worse over that sort of intervening period. And while we've seen a lot of work on making collections more accessible and we've got better understanding and some good frameworks have come in, that still is a huge challenge for all institutions and how we sort of connect that up a little bit further. So I think it's good to see we're moving onwards. I think it's good also that um, we've seen funders have really changed their funding models and been able to move things along. So things like the UK Ireland Network, um, what we've been able to do in RL UK and RL UK with Clear, and some of those other things have really helped those skills discussions and allowed us to kind of develop further. But I suppose the journey isn't over and we need to continue the work um, and kind of work and, and again work more and look at what Europe's doing, what's happening in the Netherlands and what's happening in other countries to gain inspiration for different ways of tackling, work with the sort of data science community and, and just keep things things moving. So there's a lot of work to do, but I think it's, it's heartening to know that things have also moved on. Um, but I think again, Good to hear some of the challenges. I don't know if there's anything else you'd want to add to that, Eleonora. No, it's it's been a great, um, well, you, you kind of summarised the discussion that we had and the challenges that we've been facing. And, and I do agree, we moved 
quite um we are far away from where we started but there is still a long road in front of us <laughs> before we can say we kind of solve everything um but the good thing is we're all together to talk and discuss and moving forward so the the uh, as long as the conversation and the communication continue to happen i think we're just gonna move in the same direction and um, getting a little bit closer <laughs>